Welcome back to The Charismatic Voice. I am joined today by Ren. Thank you so much, Ren, for being here and taking time. Uh, how are you doing? It's my pleasure. Yeah, I'm doing well. I'm, it's, it's, still, it's been a very surreal weekend. Um, and I've got all my friends here at the moment. So my sofas are full of people right now. Um, <laughs> it's been really nice. It's been really nice. Is everybody just celebrating the yeah. new album? Exactly, yeah. So, so the guys flew out last Tuesday. And we've just kind of, it's just, it's just great. Like the, the team of people that I've got surrounding me who have been on board with a lot of this stuff are just first and foremost people that I've known as friends for years. A lot of them. I mean, I've known Sam since I was like 16 years old and um, <laughs> Josh as well. I've known for years and years. And then Brigitte I've known for about six years. So it's really nice that, that there's just, there's just a lot of people around me who um, when we sort of like hang out and talk about, the ways that we were going to go and quite unorthodoxly promote this album, um, it, it was just, it just kind of felt like being excited with friends coming up with ideas, which is why I think it so naturally just happened. And it wasn't like you're going into a, a board meeting or a business meeting and being like, right, how can we market the album? It's, it's just like, <laughs> it, it just kind of feels like a very creative hub of conversation that is first and foremost, just the sort of chats you'd be having with your friends. So, I think that was a really integral part of getting excited about the ideas that we were using to push this album. Yeah. That feels very in line with everything I've read about you and your career too. Yeah, a hundred percent. And and it's funny because the times in my career where, where we've gone the other way and we've done it the more sort of traditional tried and tested methods, I found myself getting frustrated at, um, all the meetings that you have to take that seem a little bit mm -hmm. pointless, it's like meetings for the sake of having a meeting and you're spend, you know, you're jumping on Zoom or you're talking about things that are, it, it just kind of, it, 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 for me, it was like devoid of a bit of that passion. And, and um, I feel like I've really found myself in a place now that just really works because it kind of suits more the, the approach that I take to creativity. And you can apply that approach to promotion as well. It doesn't have to necessarily be these, sort of like boring <laughs> uh, business <laughs> meetings about what we're going to do with and what how we're going to allocate budgets and stuff like that is it, it we, we've really managed to keep a way that makes it just exciting and playful and I think yeah. that's a big part of my philosophy in doing these things I love it I love it and it's it feels fresh and like it's so human and connects to us I think partly because you have this very authentic way of approaching every aspect of your music creation and putting out your music mm. yeah i mean it's just for for me it's it's about that there's that uh the line i, I quote it quite a lot because it's one of my favorite moments of anything being captured on camera the bill hicks at the end of one of his shows where he's talking about life just being a ride and and it's and it's so true it's like i want to create a carve out a space for myself where the fun remains in all of it so that i can keep that sort of like quite childlike approach to everything that I do because I think that when I'm excited by something and really and it just feels like this exciting idea um the ideas become a lot better hmm I want to dive into that more because I think that that's like very mm. wrapped up in your approach and probably how you're just taking the song from the very beginning but before we get in too deep to yeah. that I have to ask sure. do you prefer tea or coffee <laughs> uh tea I can't have coffee it's too uh a <gasps> because of my MCAS stuff and and B, um, just like the over -stim stimulatory nature of like caffeine. So like a tea, I'm I'm like a herbal tea guy. Gotcha. So no caffeine in your diet whatsoever. Nope. That's amazing. That's that's actually yeah. super good. And and I've had to do it many many times, like while pregnant. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And after the initial uh, withdrawal from caffeine, which is not too strong because I'm a tea drinker, I don't drink that much caffeine. But yeah. after that, it does get to a, a pleasant place. But then once a baby's born, it's like, oh boy, I need some caffeine. Give me some caffeine. <laughs> yep. Give me, give me. Yeah, well, I used to, I used to like, when I was a, a kid, like a teenager, I used to, um, actually even younger, I was obsessed with these things called cappuccino coffee beans and you can just eat them. They're like these coffee beans with like white chocolatey something around them. And I just mm -hmm. used to munch on those and just be like in an absolute caffeine buzz as a kid, <laughs> just like, give me more. I was obsessed. <laughs> My parents had to stop me in the grocery store from going to the coffee bean aisle and uh, yep. taking the coffee beans off of the floor and eating them. 
<laughs> I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Well, I really <laughs> like the taste of it, though. But I didn't yeah, know. It was I used dirty. to eat those. You know the, the the little pills that are just sweeteners that you're meant to put into like Splendor and stuff like that. You just pop into a car. I just used to eat those as well. Oh, <laughs> just, just put them on, a, and that's like intense sweetness in my mouth. But Ooh. yeah, kid brain like that stuff. <laughs> it's uh, it's hilarious. I think sometimes when we remember things as kids that we did that we turned out okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, okay, yeah, is it <laughs> kind of made it. <laughs> <laughs> so subjective word but yeah i think i turned right. out okay <laughs> i love it well i have this i have this big question i've been going through lots of different things and um for me one of the reasons that your music uh really got to me so so quickly is because i had had so many struggles with depression especially in like early 20s oh my word i was it was a dark dark time for a while there and if i felt like the first song I heard, Hyren, I felt that that mm. spoke so closely to that sort of darker side of Elizabeth and uh, and had this lighter side that was essentially hoped, saying, like, you can you can make it through it. Hi there, Ren. It's been a little while. Did you miss me? You thought you buried me, didn't you? Risky. Because I always come back. Deep down, you know that. Deep down, you know I'm always in periphery. Ren, on your pleased to see me. It's been weeks since we spoke, bro. I know you need me. You're the sheep. I'm the shepherd. Not your place to lead me. Not your place to be biting off the hand that feeds me. Hi, Ren. I've been taking some time to be distant. I've been taking some time to be still. I've been taking some time to be by myself since my therapist told me I'm ill. And I've been making some progress lately. And I've learned some new coping skills. So I haven't really needed you much, man. I think we need to just step back and chill. And, uh, and so I wanted to know, when did, that, um, when did that sort of struggle of like sort of this dark and light or when did mental um, illness or depression, when did that first start uh, becoming a struggle in your life? Probably from a really young age. I'd say I was probably about seven or eight. Mm -hmm. when it when it became like a prevalent pre like the darkness sort of like you know if you if you read a lot of I, I used to write bring these little books with me everywhere where I would just write things about about life I'd sometimes give it to a friend and like give it and say look you've got two days and you've got four pages you can do whatever you want on these four pages I've still got these books somewhere and um oh. and, and it's beautiful because you know I've got I've got stuff from Joe who died and I've got stuff from my other friend Callum who died not sh not long after and so I've got all these little snapshots of 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 some of my closest friends but uh, I I think I noticed what one thing that struck me I remember coming back to it in my sort of mid twenties after after not having picked it up for a while and reading a lot of the stuff that I'd written even when I was like 11, 12, 13, 14 because I used to just keep on bringing these new books and, and just filling them up and, and it was with everything it was sometimes it was a bit like journaling sometimes it was just like drawing sometimes it was whatever and um I think one thing that struck me was like oh damn I really that sort of like darkness was such a prevalent theme in my life you know because there'd be just like pictures of like a crowd of people and then just me and just like so separated from that crowd of people and um just writings that that were really sort of like de delving into quite a dark place and um so I think it was like having sort of like even before my illness started and, and became a big theme, central theme in my life. I think there was always that there. And, and you know, the, 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 there's a number of factors that could have been a catalyst for that. Uh, you know, like got bullied quite badly in school when I was a kid. Um, and then my way of compensating from getting bully, bullied, I think, was just to become this really sort of naughty kid because then it was like that was the way that I'd get the respect of my peers and so mm. I, I ended up getting kicked out of a school when I was um when I was 10 for just being a troublemaker basically had to move to a different school and then the the whole thing kind of repeated because this was a much nicer school that, that my parents had intentionally sent me to and then so here's like naughty me climbing out of windows and stuff like that in the lesson and just being a little shit, a little terrorist. <laughs> and, um, and and then the other kids not getting it because I was kind of like the only one being like that. And then and then being ostracized for that and, and then just trying to f navigate this thing as a kid. Um, and then that just kind of leaked into when I went into secondary school as well. So there was always like this, I don't know, I, I always just kind of felt like I didn't quite fit in anywhere. And um. And I suppose as I've gotten older, that's that's always still it's still been a bit of the case in terms of feeling a bit like an outlier, an outsider. But 
I've just, as you get older, you get better of finding people who relate to that, who you can surround yourself with. So I've, you know, surrounded myself with a bunch of very, very lovely misfits. And, um, <laughs> and then it feels more like a community. And I think human beings, we always crave community. We always yeah. crave, a, you know, a feeling of belonging. And I've definitely found that the older I've got. I think it, it you hit on a couple of things in there that just completely, uh, I, I feel are so true that, especially this idea as a kid, a lot of times we're getting labels put on us or like if we get shifted into one direction, we decide to sort of see, oh, does this other outfit, does this fit on me? And mm. And then you talk about how later on in life you realize you just don't really fit anywhere and that's okay because then you get to choose what you want to be. But it, it's so hard, I think, as you're trying to figure out what things fit on a lot of people. Uh, I think I feel like it's really easy to get lost in figuring out who you are when you have so many different boxes that just haven't quite fit on. And then you find out yeah. as an adult when you get into that, well, hopefully some people don't find it. But I think you definitely found out like, oh, my gosh, here is my beautiful, unique personality. And this is exactly who I am. And it doesn't match any of those labels that people put on me earlier yeah a hundred percent yeah and and it's great being surrounded by people like that um because <laughs> I, I think i think one of the things following the, the the traditional route of you go to school you go to university you get a job you have a family you get a house you save up for retirement and um I, I, yeah i i don't think it ever really quite fit in to my values or the way that I wanted to live life. And I, th I think, but I think in, in that way, like coming back to it, you can kind of maintain this more like childlike approach to what you're doing as rather to have, have to do the things that you should be doing. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think that really helps for me anyway, it really helps keep life more exciting and more enjoyable when you're just creating something new from everything that already exists. You've come back to this a few times, this childlike mm -hmm. approach. So I want to I want to hone in on that just a little bit more. When you say childlike, are you talking about um, the excitement of a child when they're first learning something new? Like, what does childlike mean to you? I think it just means not being so outcome dependent. Because <gasps> when you're a kid, you're not thinking years in advance, or you're not thinking what's this going to do for my career because you haven't got a career. It's it's more just you're you're coming up with ideas simply for the process of coming up with those ideas because that's the most exciting thing for me if it's detached from outcome if it's detached from I want to do this so that this can happen I, I think kids have got a much better way of just being totally in the moment and they're doing it you know they're, they're building a giant construction out of Lego not because they can then look back at this in years it's more just for the whole process of building it and for me being in love with the building of the of, of the big castle is is the most enjoyable thing because you know, I, I don't listen to much of my music once it's done mm -hmm. unless a, a certain amount of time has elapsed because then I can really enjoy it because I've forgotten the process. But it's really just about the process of making. And um, yeah, I think that that's, that's what it is. And, and just the curiosity as well um, uh, of exploring these things and these creations I find really enjoyable. <laughs> that I am so in love with this book series called The Stormlight Archives by Brandon Sanderson. I even have these like weird LARPing uh, shard blades with swords that are foam essentially in the background. That's from that series. Um, but one yeah. of the big sayings in there is journey before destination, which is what you just described. <laughs> Process yeah, yeah. before outcome. <laughs> yeah. And, and, I, and I, think, I think as we get older as well, and when you look back at some of the ha happiest times, for me particularly so you know some of the golden periods for me within music are, are the times like when I first started busking and when me and Sam were busking and things were were really just taking off on you know a much more smaller level than they are now but at the time relative to where I was it felt huge and the same with me and the big push when we would get out on the streets and play it was like you know it it, it was a much smaller microcosm of success but it was um it was so exciting uh, uh, and, and it really was the journey it was the build that was the exciting thing was that like you know when we first started playing you'd have like five six or seven people watching and then towards the end of the summer you'd have crowds of like hundreds of people and it was just that buzz and that excitement of the actual journey itself not afterwards being like oh we've built this really big thing cool that's we, we've gotten to this point where now like 
busking videos are getting millions of views per video and stuff like that. It, it, it really was the before part the, for me, which has got the, the, the fondest memories <laughs> attached to it was, was that hustle and that grind and being in that early stages. <laughs> stages um busking and that first sort of coming together with things i'm curious how that fit in with school because this was that was still kind of at the end of your uh what do we call it primary or yeah, secondary well, schooling well my, my <laughs> early it's, it's, it's funny my early early because because when i first started busking i think i was about 18 and and my early early memories of it um it, it's funny I, I i don't know if it's partly to do with my illness or and how it's affected my brain, but my my memories, my early memories, um, even even during the, the like height of my thickness, they're all quite blurry. That it, uh, and um, a lot of the time, it's real significant moments in my childhood, my teens that I remember, and then a lot of it just is quite blurry. Um, I'm not sure why. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, when but, did yeah. when do you think you contracted Lyme disease? Did that have affected your your memory clarity? Yeah, could have. I, I was 19 years old when I first started getting symptoms <clears throat> that were, because before that, I think that I'd always like struggled with mental health stuff in, in uh -huh. that it used to come come and go in quite intense waves. Um, <clears throat> but it, it was, there was a real significant preva prevalent change when I was 19. And I remember waking up one morning after a night out in Cardiff thinking that I'd been spiked um, mm. just because the world looked very different and it looked very surreal. It's almost like, um, it's almost like my personality or my soul had been sucked out. This the only. Dis it's, it's almost like there, there was me here, the physical me, and then there was me just locked out of that physical part of me. It's the only. It's very hard to describe, but it almost felt like I had very intense derealization for the first two years. So it, it felt like everything felt not quite real. It's hard to describe, and it felt like I was looking through a tunnel. And um, and it also felt like I was robbed of the ability of spontaneous thought, which for creative is really difficult because because we kind of rely on spontaneity, and that's why I guess I didn't really release any music until 2016 with Freckled Angels because it I took a long time trying to piece that together, and mm -hmm. and bring back a sense of who I even was. Um, and it you know th there was a lot of things along the way because my misdiagnosis is so I I went to therapy maybe once a week for, for years and didn't really feel like I was getting anywhere because my physical symptoms were just getting worse. So yeah, it took a while to be able to kind of like feel like I'd boom, like landed back into my body again and I was Ren again. Because mm -hmm. before that, I felt like a bit of a shell of Ren. And I, to my understanding, I mean, wasn't it very recent that you did get some therapy finally that hopefully could could cure this and... Was that, I want to say, was that in Canada that you were getting some treatment? So I'm, I'm in Canada at the moment, I'm oh. treating the autoimmunity. And so the, the big turning point for me was actually, I started health blogging when I was about 24 or 25, which I carried on for a couple of years. And I, because I, I thought that I was going to die before I'd hit 30. So I, I just kind of was like, well, because I didn't want to put that much ugliness I suppose on camera until the point where I felt like it was almost like a responsibility because of getting the story of so many people out there and stuff so I couldn't make music at the time but I was blogging and I was putting it up on Facebook and um yeah it, it was um so I've lost I've lost my train of thought a little bit uh oh yeah no sorry so so I, I was putting out all these videos and then, you know, I, I, was, I was broke at the time and I don't come from a well-off family so the the more like unorthodox treatments were definitely out of reach mm -hmm. and um i just i just saved up i'd done a fundraiser and saved up for probably about half a year to do this thing um <clears throat> that, that cost six thousand pounds and it took up to a, a half a year to raise that six thousand pounds and then i finally did this thing back home in the uk and it made me significantly worse and, and that was such a heartbreaking Oof. thing because yeah. i've been 
tirelessly trying to raise this money and then I raised the money. I did the thing, um, which was meant to help rebalance my immune system and it went totally the other way. And I, I, that was the point where I went into psychosis. I, th I think it was the, it was a combination of A, my immune system being on super overdrive from this thing that I did. And then also at the same time, just the heartbreak of like, damn, like we're, we're told to work towards this goal. Then I've had so much hope, hope pinned on this goal and then I just got so much worse. And then I, th I think my mental health couldn't really deal with that. So I went into a, a state of psychosis where I suppose I, I created a narrative for myself that would justify my situation. And, and the narrative at the time was uh, two, two things. One, that it, it was this kind of like experiment that I was part of and one that it was demonic. So, and, and I was convinced that it couldn't be anything other than, than demonic because of how insidious it felt and how, mm. you know, I, I couldn't get, at that point, I couldn't even read a book while I was in bed because my brain was so fatigued that um, all I could do was just kind of like lie there and wait in pain for for days and days and days um on end and and only sometimes have the strength to stand in a shower but even that was pretty excruciating or all my meals had to be blended um so it's just like basically soup so i lost a lot of weight and um anyway so i carried on blogging um just kind of like succumb to 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 that like okay well that, that was my that was my life and um and the stem cell doctor found a video and I suppose felt a sense felt a sense of empathy and said, look, if you get yourself to LA, um, I can I can give you a stem cell transplant for free. Uh, all I want you to do is talk about your journey with it on this blog. So wow. So so that's what I did. I I went over to LA and I did the stem cell transplant and it. Yeah, it was it was a really intense procedure. It was six weeks of like really intensive IVs, preparing my body, getting it strong enough again, and then doing the stem cell transplant which is it's with liposuction. So they take the stem cells out of your own fat. And then um, I went home and, and yeah, just things started over the course of six months. It was a very slow thing. It wasn't like an overnight, oh, I feel better. Uh, my energy started coming back and my clarity of thought started coming back. And that's really, it was about eight months after that, that I put out the video Blind Eyed with my friend Sam, which is one of the first mm -hmm. proper videos I'd put out in a long time. Sometimes I bleed, sometimes I crawl, sometimes I slip, sometimes I fall Sometimes my back's up against the wall so hard that the whole building could fall Sometimes I break, sometimes I break, sometimes I'm true, sometimes I'm fake Sometimes I'm over for a moment when the forward to start opening is swallowing me for goodness sake And I think I'm gonna break, cause the ache in this plate, I'm awake in a ball full of pain So I'm I no cape, and I'm pressing the brakes, but the brakes they break And I'm driving my universe into a lake, and the wait, wait at the world, don't wait We make mistakes when it's all at stake, we cook our cake, we eat our cake Sometimes no time for double taste, but that's just the way life goes sometimes But I don't wanna end up in the dark be a rap on my trouble face down in the puddle where the sun don't shine I'm coming to give him the backbone, the and attack and the stack and I'll be stuck in it with this one I'm packing and I'm praying Oh Lord, take this pain away Away, away, away And um, yeah, it just started blowing up all over the internet People started sharing it around and it was real like this It was like the second chance because at, at that point um, I think the paradigm sh shift has changed But back when I was in my early 20s People kind of tell you if you haven't made it by the time you're like in your late twenties, the, the kind of opportunities come and gone. Oh, so it's really firm for me. <laughs> it's, 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 it's bullshit. People have literally. <laughs> I had some. In, I, had some I had some industry people literally tell me this. Um, yeah. So 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 wrong. So to have this <laughs> to have this second to have this second chance felt really really good, and and things started blowing <laughs> up everywhere, and it, it, uh, and that was it. And then I went back to Frankfurt and I did another stem cell transplant. Um, and, and in, in LA, sorry, I stayed with a couple who were doing it because I couldn't afford a hotel or, or an Airbnb. And, and I, was, I stayed with this amazing couple who were going through the same thing. And yeah, it was yeah. beautiful. It, it, and, and it really worked. And, and it worked for them as well. And it was really nice to see. Matt, I, one of my favorite things about listening to your journey is the way that, um, that it, even though you think, that, and you're aiming for getting better the whole time, you... I think you have some pretty clear ideas about what you're aiming for. Um, yeah. There are so many disappointments that still happen along the way. And I think yeah. I've seen a lot a lot of people that I think have this intense mental struggle because they're going towards something, they get there, they expect to be happy then, um, and they are just faced with disappointment that the reality doesn't meet the expectation. And yeah. You are a great example of someone who 
fought through that disillusionment, um, the disappointment of one thing not working, but you kept going and you said, I'm going to try this next thing. I feel like it's so, mm. uh, so important and poignant, especially for people that struggle with depression off and on, because the moment it comes back or any sort of health or, or mental struggle, when it comes back after you feel like mm. you've gotten rid of it, it is just disheartening. You think, oh my gosh, this again, how is this still coming back and affecting my life so much? And it, that can make everything worse. But the important thing is just keep going. There, there is a light yeah. at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> yeah, there was, there was a quote, quote from Thomas Edison that, that was, I haven't failed. I've just found a thousand things that don't work. And I think <laughs> I that, that. Was, that was my... Yeah, that that was that was kind of my always approach with that. I don't know why. I think I was just wired in this way that was very very persistent. Because I mean, the things that didn't work, the list of those things is so much bigger than the list of things that did. I mean, because I tried thousands and people with like ME or chronic health problems who have got that sort of tenacity in them probably relate. But I tried once I realized that the NHS wasn't going to help, and I went to this ME meeting and they were telling me to manage my expectations. I I think I had um, a good way of just not accepting what I was told um, and seeking out stories of people who had overcome almost impossible adversity, whether that be stories of people diagnosed with terminal cancer who managed to turn it around by going slightly more unorthodox routes. And um, those stories were always really inspiring to me because I didn't want to be told that this is just it. You know, you have to deal with this and you have to accept it. And that there's, there is an element of acceptance that comes into it. But I think this there's kind of this paradox of like, you have to accept where you are while simultaneously not accepting where you are, because if you were totally to accept where you are, you wouldn't all, you wouldn't be looking for a better way of of life. Mm -hmm. So it's like this this kind of paradox of like I'm accepting that I'm ill, and I'm accepting that this illness may be with me for life, but I'm also still searching for a way to be better. Because otherwise, if you don't accept it, you're constantly at war, and, and that's where I was um, for a long time, for years. It didn't take me; it took me a long time to actually come to that place of acceptance, and. Um, but it was that tenacity, like, you know, I tried countless supplements, some that made me a lot worse. I didn't understand why they were making me worse until years later. I went once I'd, once like allopathic medicine and, and, and the, the sort of like mainstream medicine had let me down and I tried countless things from antidepressants to antipsychotics to um, various immune modulating drugs. Once I wasn't getting anywhere with those. I then started leaning more into the spiritual and, and, and being like seeing stories of people who had been like, well, my whole life I was in pain and I went to see a shaman and then it all turned around. So I started doing things like that. I went to see shamans. I went to Buddhist meetups. I, I went to Christian groups. I almost became a bit of a spiritual tourist to, to be like, well, maybe there's one, there's one part of this world that will lead to my salvation. And, um, and really took it, really took it really seriously. And I suppose that's where the, a lot of religious themes leak into my work because I, mm. I, I had this war with the gods because still I wasn't finding those answers um, within there. I was finding a lot of uh, inspiration from the philosophy and the mythology, but it was just that, it was just words and it was just perspective. It wasn't actually a tangible physical healing. So and um, as you were, we, as you were doing that, did you ever write things down? Cause you mentioned writing journals earlier. Was that something you continued yeah. doing? Yeah, but I haven't really, it kind of breaks my heart to read those. So I haven't really read them very much. I, I used to write goals. Um, mm. and, and I, I read one semi recently and, and it just made me really sad because like it was, it was like a list of things that I wanted. And one of them was like, have a conversation with a stranger at a bus stop and it felt like a monumental task that I'd be setting myself that I'd be building up for towards the end towards the end of the week and there's like all of these things that were like yeah that seemingly s things that are very easy for me to, 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 be, to be to do these days but uh, right at the time felt like a monumental task or you know go for a walk for 10 minutes or um so yeah I don't I, uh, they, they exist, um, but a lot of the, a lot of them I threw out, just because it, it just reminds me of a time that wasn't great in my life. Hmm. But it's still, uh, I I find that a lot of times very successful people have some sort of um, writing or, or deliberateness about how they approach their days. And it sounds mm. like you are doing that, uh, and you've been mm. doing it 
since you were very very young yeah yeah 100 percent. and and but yeah i mean i mean that's the thing it wasn't a quick journey i mean it, so it was 19 until really i was about i was about 26 when the first shift happened so that's that's a good seven years um the significant shift that allowed me to be a lot more like active in life and the first couple of years i was still up until i was about 21 i was still semi-functional i just had to carry i just had to live in this thick brain fog mm -hmm. thick fatigue and 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 quite a lot of pain in my body but i was still able to hang out with friends make music ish but then after i think 21 i really deteriorated until i was about 26 25 was probably my worst year and um Oof. and then after that i've just dealt with symptoms after the stem cell transplant there were still a lot of symptoms that were happening and I still have to fight through which is why I'm now here in Canada just trying to I'd say I got to about 60 or 70 percent capacity and which I'm living at the moment I'm just trying to claw back that that last 30 to get to and it's it's surreal because it's like I'm aiming for something that I forgot how it feels I'm aiming for <laughs> I just know I feel like I know when I'll get there but I'm aiming for to feel normal to be in a to feel like a normal person would normal person would feel inside their body which That's... i assume is just you know not, not constant pain in my <laughs> yeah. in my bones and 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 a, a clarity of thought that's only really hindered by if i stay up too late if i push myself too far or, or if i'm stressed but and not just like the chaos and unpredictability of like oh i've woken up and i've got all these like crushing symptoms and there's not really any there's no point a to point b it just happens randomly even mm -hmm. if I'm really looking after myself. So yeah, oh, wow. that's kind of what I'm aiming for. Yeah. Gosh, I know it's on such a smaller scale, but I, I feel that um, frustration, at especially the lack of mental clarity and the unpredictability of that from mm. after I'd given birth to my son, I had these problems with hormones not resetting correctly, which apparently is super common, but people just don't talk about uh, right. it. Huh. And my, uh, my, I got this mental fog and this drain so much to the point that I was having problems actually putting sentences together. And I had to yeah. step back, go to a ton of doctors and just really mm. didn't find much help um, until uh, I, I had a, I was actually kind of surprised a naturopath helped me get a bunch of things together and explained that there were just some glands that were depleted. It wasn't a pathology, but it was depleted yeah. from the pregnancy and then that helped me get back to where I could be. But you were talking about that percentage. For me, I, I yeah. live often by an 80-20 rule. And if I feel like I'm less than 80%, I just have to stop because I feel like I yeah. can't I can't give less than 80 to anybody that's watching on YouTube. I just, I can't do that. I yeah. know I've got a lot of things stored up. I've got a, a big history of just understanding voice and music. So it, I can get there with 80, but less than that. And I just feel like, oh, I just, I owe it to my audience to be able to give better. And it wasn't mm. possible to do that for a long time. It was really hard. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a really interesting thing you've touched on as well, because I think that, because for me, certainly that, that, that was a thing like holding myself to a particular standard. And it's funny because every now and then something that you can put out there in the sphere of public awareness happens that you're really not quite happy with or you know that there was a video that I released uh from 2015 quite recently on the lead up to high run where I was just breaking down and mm. I look very different I look very sort of like my face is puffy I look a lot more ill and um but there was something about the realness and the rawness of it maybe even though I wasn't articulating myself in in such a uh, obvious way or, or, or in, in such a way that feels like me there was something in the authenticity of that place so so um I think I felt like that less and less now so 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 like if I'm feeling that haze I'll, I'll probably still do an interview or still just because I kind of believe in it just being what it is so that people that are going through those similar things they don't want to always just see somebody on the top form of their game because life isn't like that regardless of if you're <laughs> going through problems with hormones or health or anything i think um people just want to see real particularly in today's age because everything's so oversynthesized and everything's so yes. it's, it's kind of like fast fast food entertainment which is why i think things like podcasts and just like two hour long conversations <laughs> have started doing a lot better because people are kind of craving it's, it's almost like a you're breathing again from this like barrage of of 
really intentional short content that, mm -hmm. that just stimulates you and just gives you that dopamine buzz the whole time i think when you step back from that and you have that peace and that space to just digest something um it feels a lot more refreshing or, or, or not refreshing but it feels like a bit of a refuge from that constant bombardment of stimulation yes i completely agree and i think it's the direction that um future media will go to because as we have a lot more content that's generated by AI, that content mm. is going to be the perfect or flawless kind of content. And it's going to yeah. be humanity with all of our vulnerability and imperfections that starts to shine through. A hundred percent. I think that's why it was, it was such an anomaly when we dropped high rent. And, and it's such an interesting thing that that was the kind of like other turning point when, when there's, there's significant turning points for me in terms of the 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 had the reach of what I'm doing and and Hiram was a big turning point and for me it was so fascinating because it's such a it's such an anti it kind of, it, it it's such a juxtaposition to what should work in today's modern age or what people tell you <laughs> should work mm -hmm. um because you know it, it it's a 9 minute long piece with a monologue at the end with no catchy chorus or discernible thing to hold on to in terms of melody, it's very unorthodox in the way that it moves and the structure of it. I am the snake in Eden. I am the reason for treason. Beheading all kings, I am sin, with no rhyme or reason. Son of the morning, Lucifer Antichrist, father of lies. Mustopheles, truth in the blender, deceitful pretender, the banished avenger, the righteous surrender. When standing in front of my solar eclipse, my name is stitched to your lips. So you see, I won't bow to the will of a mortal, feeble and normal. You wanna kill me? I'm eternal and mortal. I live in every decision that catalyzes chaos that causes division. I live inside death, the beginning of end. I am you, you are me, I am you, friend. Hi, Ren. I've been taking some time to be distant. I've been taking some time to be still. I've been taking some time to be by myself and I've spent half my life ill But just as sure as the tide starts turning Just as sure as the night has dawn Just as sure as the rain falls soon one is dry when you stand in an eye of a storm And um, so it was really interesting for me that that was the one out of, out of a lot yeah. of them that, that got the most attention. And I, and I think it's just, I think it was exactly that. I think it's because it's, it's almost like an antidote to, to fast food um to fast food entertainment because it's it, you you have to mm -hmm. be there and i think film is doing it really well um i think there's a lot of series uh, it, it just hadn't leaked so much into music yet but there's a lot of series you know like better call soul and stuff like that where there's there's just a lot of space for humanity within the shots they're sometimes uncomfortably long so that you can feel those awkward silences and c cinema started doing that more and more i think but um and moving away from the Hollywood fast action explosions. Yeah. Let's yeah. save the world. Because I, I think once you've <laughs> seen all of that, the, the visuals are still impressive, but it's like when I watched the Hobbit, I was quite disappointed because the Hobbit was such a story with a lot of heart for me. I think they kind of, they, they, they nailed it with Lord of the Rings, but with the Hobbit, it just kind of felt like a CGI bombardment and of just like, this happens and now the hobbits are on the lake and, they're boo -boo -boo, and they and they stretched it out and, and it kind of really, for me anyway, it lacked that heart of you really caring about the characters in there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for me, that was, it kind of got a bit too over Hollywoodified for a story with a lot of heart in it because I loved that book when I was a little kid. And um, yep. so yeah, for, for me, it's really <laughs> about now things that are growing and the success is growing and we have more resources there to become more ambitious. It's really, for me, it's like, okay, how do you, scale up the ambition of what we're doing visually conceptually while still really making that something that lends itself to the heart rather than detracts from the heart because if we have a big budget to do something we shouldn't do it for the sake of doing it you only really want to do it if it really emphasizes the heart and i think that's what we try to do with money game part three is yeah. um it, it is go for something that because because we had a bigger <laughs> budget to play with we had more lighting we had more interesting things that we could do get more extras on board and stuff and yeah so, that was kind of my philosophy yeah my philosophy there was like how do we take this budget and actually feed it into the heart rather than detract it 
When we release this interview, um, it'll be yeah. right after Money Game Part 1, 2, and 3. I have not listened okay. to any of these yet. And I wanted to okay. ask you, actually, as I'm going through them, is there anything in particular uh, that I should pay attention to? I like When I listen to these things, there are <laughs> so many facets that I, I want to talk about and analyze and, and usually compliment. Um, but I want to know from you, what things do you think I should direct attention towards? Well, so Money Game 1 was the most fascinating video for me that we made because it was the first time that I'd really started thinking about the cinematography of it all from a, a director because I had to get my director's head on a little bit more and we worked with this mm. amazing guy called Ricky who's a friend of my old friend of my dad's. And he he taught me so much in that time. It was the first time I'd ever worked with a director. And he just taught me so much. He was just like, there's so much lyricism to be written in the visuals that aren't lyrical. So it's like, and he was like, the most important thing you've got to do in, in cinematography is always ask a question, answer it with another question. So, so in this first Money Game video, as you'll see, I won't spoil it too much, but right at the start, it just starts with this shot of a rope sliding across the floor. So... Uh, even on a sub perceptual level if you're not being like Why, what's that rope your brain's doing it and then it leads up and then it's me wearing this big raincoat and it's like why are you wearing a raincoat and then it pans round and there's a person in a hostage mask so there's that whole video it's constantly a visual question being asked followed by an answer that's also another question it's a strange time we're living in book and put fear in hierarchy parties they make us feel inferior Read one through parliament in theories Devils walk among us, they think the criteria Eerie, they're re-stripe, fearing we're re-minded Men when we're clearly living in dictatorships Nearly blinded by illusions to choose Who's fooling who? A ball chain to your shoes, I'm pain It's a crying shame The pursuit of our own wealth lies a flame That makes greed the game The less this whole war burn As the world turns, the whole world burn Oh my god! And gosh. it's just a way of it's a way of unfolding a story in, in a way the way you don't need words. So you do have the lyrics going on as well, but that's intriguing. I, and yeah. I, it, it was some of the most interesting advice that I'd ever been given. So we pulled, we pulled off that one with probably a budget of under 500 pounds. And um, wow. we had a, a, a team of my friends, Sam was there on, on that shoot and we had a team of my friends there and um, we just broke into this really dingy looking place under the pier. And the first time we turned up, there were waterworks going on. So we, we had this whole crew, we had everything prepared. We went there and we couldn't do it just because we were at mercy of the elements. And then we mm -hmm. came back again, we filmed it and we looked, watched back and it just wasn't right. I don't know, it just didn't have that magic. So we had to go back a third time and, and you know, but each time we were adding bits onto the, the narrative of the visuals and it turned on it turned from this quite a simple concept into this very elaborate concept and so it really even though it was a painful thing i think from that foot the second day we did it to the, to the last day we did it, i think it was like 137 takes of like a six minute long video which is a lot it's, mm -hmm. a, it's exhausting it's mm -hmm. exhausting we were there till like three four in the morning um wow. but then we finally that pulled is exhausting. off because yeah because you don't have the luxury of cuts so you really have to it, you really have to nail the whole performance from start to finish um without with, with a lot of lyrics going on as well. I love, so, I so, love yeah, was, the one take. Just just throwing that out there. I think mm. it's brilliant. I love it. And it's so human. So thank you for making that a priority. Yeah, no, I, I love it too. I love the challenge of it because you really have to, you can't really think too much about, oh, I didn't hit that note. We've got to start again. Because because that really throws the whole thing off. If, if you're If you're anything but but the character or the narrative of that story in the moment that you're filming, you can do hours and hours of preparation work, which I do beforehand so that it almost becomes second nature to be reciting the lyrics and the notes being there. But really when the camera's on, you have to be the character. It's, it's, it's quite a lot like acting and you have to really believe that you're in that moment. And it's, it was a difficult thing to do. And I think I just learned by doing because you could be really in it and then something messes up and then you have to do another take and you have to, forget that you did the take before because otherwise you're very self-aware and the whole goal is to forget that you're you you have to stop being self-aware and i think that's the, the 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 skill of a good actor is just believing it yourself and it's, mm -hmm. it's really difficult once you're on take 137 to, to for it not to feel slightly <laughs> robotic and, and and rehearsed yeah so um find the freshness still it's like it feels like it's almost just gone at that point <laughs> Yeah, and you have to do whatever you have to do to get yourself back in there, especially when you're kind of running on depleted resources of energy. 
So for them, for Money Game 3, like skipping forward, because mm-hmm. um, we didn't do a video for Money Game 2, we just had a lyric video, but for Money Game 3, there was, I, I'd had a lot more, we'd done so many more, we'd done vi- all the tales. Um, so I, I think it was a lot more comfortable. It was only, because there there's a hidden cut behind this wheelchair scene, but that, so it's, in, it's essentially two sections. Let me tell you a story about a boy named Jimmy One years old and his first words were My, my, gimme Two years old he was walking Three years old walking quickly Four years old he was running round the pavements of his city Five years old and his daddy told him Listen here son, you gotta learn to be a man A man he works for what he wants Six years old and he's reading writing Top of the bunch And when he's seven His progression made him student number one Eight years old and he's praised for unusual grades Nine, his parents paid for private school to nurture the flame Ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen He ascends and ascends His daddy tells him son Money is the means to all ends But I had a lot more to draw from From my past experience So we, we... I think both takes were under 20 takes for, for each Oh, section. wow. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so that, nice. was, that was really good. But it, we still finished really early in the morning, but um, but that was because there was a lot more moving parts. There were a lot more extras to kind of direct and stuff like that. And, um, uh-huh. and but, uh, but what was game, your budget then? Oh, so, so, f- so for the first one, it was under 500. For this one, I think we must have spent anywhere from 25 to 30K. So a significant wow. jump up. Yeah, <laughs> signi- sig- significant um, yeah. budget, budget difference. I, uh, there was something I can't remember what it was I think I did this like flow on uh, this course on something called flow state by this amazing guy I need to find his name it's not jumping to the top of my head but um, they the way that he told he, that he taught that he approaches money is that money is clay it's not because because a lot of the time I think in our society we've turned money to be the end goal it's not the means it's 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 the ac- the accumulation of money is is the goal when it's it's quite strange because money is a tool really when you look at it it's just it's just paper and metal I mean, it hasn't hasn't really got much functionality it's just an idea and um he was like look if you look at money like clay you can build bigger things the more clay you have the more grandeur your uh, creations can become but you you still can't forget that with a little lump of clay, you can really form something really quite beautiful if the intent and the idea and the energy is behind it. So it's just like, sure, we've got this, we've got more clay now, but equally we could have probably made a video just as captivating as that with a lot less, with a lot, if the intent was there. And I don't really ever want to lose that. Um, I don't want to just, because there's more clay there, keep upscaling and upscaling and upscaling. It doesn't really mm-hmm. need to happen. It's really just like, what serves this idea? And for Money Game 3, having more clay really served that idea so that's what we did so that's what we did but it doesn't necessarily mean that's the approach that i'm going to take going forward it, it's just that what will lend itself to this idea um the best what serves it the best i love this uh, analogy of money is clay thank you i'm going to use mm. that yeah it's cool <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really cool. So uh, thinking about all of these uh, one shots and and needing to be able to perform things on the spot, well, 167 times or something like that's right. That's insane to me. But one of the (laughs) things that also is insane is how you're able to capture a good performance. So I watched uh, all the tales, did them all together as well, back to back. It's so epic. But where did you put the mics? Um, they're, they're just here, they're, they're just little lapels. You have, and yeah, yeah, is yeah. that mic that's your lapel for your voice, is that the same one that's on your guitar? No, so the guitar is DI'd, so I carry a Zoom in my pocket, or sometimes oh. in Violet's Tale, it was gaffer taped to my stomach um, underneath the robe. So, so I have Got this, it. and then you have, because you can see it in moments if you, look, if you kind of like look with the intent of looking for it. There's a wire going from my guitar into this Zoom um, through the back of my robe and then you have the lapel just going into a phone mm-hmm. um, from uh, yeah just just clipped on to wherever whatever outfit makes the most sense to me to get the most clarity of my voice come through so then as far as lapel goes like I know lapel mics sometimes just don't give the best full sensation of the voice yet I feel like it's captured your voice quite quite well so what that, kind that's of- hours of meticulous mixing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because because I'll, I'll, I'll have an I'll have an a I'll have an AB with maybe like a mic like this, and um I will just it was the same with the the piano on Money Game, but 
that I, I'll, I'll have a reference and then it's just hours of painstaking carving out because you get a lot of boxiness in, in lapel mics, regardless mm -hmm. of what it is. And then you yeah. also get a lot of variance if I turn my head in volume. So you really have to volume um, and you can't just use a compressor on it because you really have to yeah. line by line automate the volume so that you're getting a real consistent what you would in a studio take. So it's just painstaking hours. I, I've always... I, I had a lot of practice from mixing busking sessions with the big push because with them oh. you have to, we're out on the street. Watch out, not really sure what it's all about. Get down, can't be a square if you get around. We use an iPhone by the drum kit. We we line each individual amp into a zoom, and then um, and then I've mixed those. But I, that's something I really proud myself on. And one of my favorite insults I've ever got on the internet was was that was like, "There's no way." And this guy was really passionately arguing with me. He was just like, "There's no way this isn't done in the studio. You're miming." There's just no way. And, and that was almost like a backhanded <laughs> compliment for me because it 100% was live. And I, I was just like, it, it was quite a heated debate. And I was like, mate, just come over to my house and let me show you the project file and you'll see that this is live. But um, it was it was a good, I think it was a good thing because ultimately if, if this guy who's in music, because he was like, I'm a producer and uh -huh. I know this isn't live. It's like, if this if this guy is, is can't believe it then i must be doing something right so i had a lot yeah. of but that was just hours and hours of painstaking like that whole drum kit all the drum sounds you hear in the big push that is just an iphone picking that up um it's, it's just wow. that i spent a lot of time you and and sometimes you have to meticulously cut out each snare and boost each snare or, and maybe saturate a little bit with distortion but it's still the snare on the day we, we never we never stacked it up or recorded things on top of it that's so, that yeah, is incredible I, <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's a labor of love because those sessions aren't easy to mix but um i i, I um i do love it so that that really helped um, i want to see one of those I, sessions like like if you ever put out a, a short or a five minute thing just showing one of those sessions and the various plugs and the way you've mixed it oh my gosh i would be yeah. so so fascinated by that <laughs> <laughs> they look very chaotic because there's so much chopping out and just like volume no. automation that they look very yeah. chaotic. And yeah. I've never been one of these. So sometimes that, you know, I've, I've gone, I've gone to do sessions with producers and they have like, they open up their logic project and like all the synths are color coordinated and all the vocals are color coordinated and they're all on their own nice clean tracks that have been chopped up. And mine, I, I my projects usually look like, you know, you've got 150 tracks and they're all haven't got names and none of them are color coordinated, but they're all it just blue. seems to be the way. Right. The yeah. They're all blue. It just seems to be yep. the way that works for me. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever used this plugin called, I think it's called Vocal Writer? Uh, it's like, yeah. it's, yeah. I was thinking about that yeah. when you're talking about not compression, but just the really truly adjusting dynamics. And mm. that one has saved me some time, but it sounds like in your situation, it wouldn't actually be specific enough. You'd really have to get into the nitty gritties even a little bit more to yeah, get that. Yeah. And because, because there's also as well when you're live, you have like peaking that you can't quite control. So, it's not just mm -hmm. a case of riding it with the vo volume automation. Sometimes you're going to have to go and use tools from Isotope that remove a little bit of the distortion and clipping from vocals. And it's, so it's, it's very meticulous. You have to do, you almost have to treat each line like a separate vocal. You mix it when you're in the studio and you record a vocal, you have the luxury of going slap some EQ on it, slap a compression on it, slap some parallel compression on it. And there we go. We've got a vocal. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really not like that with these live sessions at all. Yeah. i uh, you just hollered about my uh, absolute favorite plugin that I ever use. It's actually Isotope RX. What are they at? Like ten now. That mm -hmm. ability in in that uh, software where you can take a look at like the room noise and take out the room noise, or if there is peaking, where you can yeah. take out the sound of it peaking. It's incredible. I such a good mm. tool for vocal production. Yeah, and it's getting better and better. I mean, the yeah. AI stuff that can like lift a guitar from the drums and the vocals and just give you that guitar is, 
it's it's in, it's in, it's really incredible what they can do um yep. and some of the auto-tune things that can look at a chord and you can change the notes within the chord it's fascinating yeah. to me how they're able to uh -huh. isolate these and and then preserve them with such clarity if you if they're contained within yeah. a whole mix um and that's and just it, getting better and better these days it boggles my mind within that chord like i think it's melody that you're probably talking about where you can see the various uh -huh. pitches that are uh, set out there and yep. you can switch one in the middle to be higher yeah it boggles my mind that not only is it switching this pitch but it reorders all of the overtones which are all affecting each other so how do they maintain the the it's timbral crazy. quality it's just yeah it's nuts yeah it's, it is insane yeah Ugh, yeah so cool but yeah i really want to see a session like that i i would be so okay. excited <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, so let's come back to the mic. What mic are you actually using? Um, so I'm using a, a Rode SmartLav Plus for most of the one takes, which is just, it's pretty consumer entry level mic. Mm -hmm. um, very affordable. You know, I think it's like 60 or 70 pounds. Um, you know, because those back, back then the budgets weren't big. And yeah, the, the sound isn't, it's really not great out of the box, but you just, it's just really about carving out that boxiness. And then for the, I think we used a DPA for Money Game Part Three, which is much better. Um, lav, it, it's it, it's industry. It's what they use in um, theater. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got this this funny thing that they do where they put it on the top of your head, <laughs> David, on your hairline, <laughs> and then yep. they kind of like <laughs> cover it with like skin tone makeup. But we didn't do that. Um, yeah, or like a or wig like a liner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But no, we we always just clipped it on. But we used the DP, DPA's um, submarine or something. I think it was called, but that it's a lot easier to work with. So mixing money game was a much more mm -hmm. enjoyable process. Oh, I, that was one of the things I was really curious about is as your budget was getting bigger, was that something you were switching out or did you find yeah. your signature sound and, and, on a and, mic? And, that and, was... and, this, mm -hmm. and this is what I mean by the, like the clay thing. It's really just about like, okay, we have the ability now to do something which makes the post-production a lot easier and yeah. potentially comes with a much more uh sonically pleasing results so if we have the opportunity to do that then we'll use it yeah that's awesome yeah. okay but in order to do any of this it sounds like you have to just practice a ton so that everything feels second nature because you really are doing it all not just the visuals but even the music all in one take yeah yeah there's a lot there's a heck of a lot of preparation i'm such a perfectionist yeah. with these things that by the time it gets to the day i mean i could I could recite those things in my sleep because I've gone over it so many times. Cause it's so, there's so many moving parts visually and performance wise that are going on that I can't afford for my memory of the lyrics or my ability to hit those notes to be a factor, to be a, mm -hmm. a variable. So I just practice those to death until that it's like walking through that whole thing in my brain. I've done it a million times before I've even got to the set. So at this point in your career, you've been practicing these things to death for a very, very long time. I think you must have developed some sort of practice strategy that works for you. Do you have a deliberate way of breaking things down that you feel like is very helpful? Um, for me, it's just, it's, it's the same with school, right? Like in school, I was, because I was such a little shit, I was one of those little shits <laughs> that really still frustrated the teachers because I, I you know, we had this thing called effort grades and actual grades oh boy and the effort and, and so it would be ranked one is best effort two is mid-range and three is terrible and my report card looked like a three 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 you know a three a three a three and i think that frustrated the teachers because it, it means that i'm putting the min minimal amount of effort and getting the maximum results but it wasn't true i look i think i just figured out with school that it was just a game of repetition and memory which is one thing that i actually think is, is one of my biggest criticisms of the education system is that I think there needs to be a bit, a bit of a focus on creative learning and creative intelligence. Um, the way you look at things more non-linearly because it's people who looked at things non-linearly and asked a lot of questions that didn't have answers necessarily who p pushed humanity forward in terms of our inventions and someone who goes, okay, this is the answer, but a better answer could, uh, could exist as well. So I, I'm putting this down on the page, but if I was to put down a new hypothesis on the theory of evolution that didn't that wasn't in line with darwin's i would be marked with an f because it's not the correct answer even if even if i had hypothesized something that completely turned that on its head and was correct and and um it, it's this notion that there's only ever one right answer uh, and uh, that, that doesn't in inspire i think inventive intelligence um hmm. and i tried to i think um 
trying to apply that forward coming through to my work with it, it what I've learned about practice is it's just doing it over and over again and that's how I was able to get A's back in school is just that I went home I looked at what the answers were and I wrote them down on a piece of paper loads and loads of times and then when I went into the exams because there wasn't really any emotion there I think that's what fucks a lot of people up in exams if they're like oh god um, there's so much pressure there's so much emotion I never really felt like that I was always just like well I've got to remember all these things so I'm just going to remember them and then I came down and did the test and then I got good grades and then I didn't have to, I didn't have to put in the pain so they can work in class and I could just be a little shit. And then, but then with rehearsal, it's kind of the same thing. It's just like, I just have to repeat this loads of times until it's there. And, that, and that's really it. I don't need to get stressed about the big day it happening. All I need to know is that I have to do this so many times to give myself enough time that the performance is there with this very monotonous repeating, 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 mm -hmm. repeating. And, yep. and that's, the, that's really, it's just really as simple as that. I didn't really have any structure sometimes i could just be sitting out in a park by myself or like sitting out on my stairs and just doing it again and again and again I'd find a place with nice reverb and just do it again until it's there and that's the monotonous bit and you mentioned and then, writing it were you writing when you say doing it again were you just saying it or were you writing it down sometimes too um, i mean no i mean once once the lyrics are there they're written down it's really just repeating those lyrics until they stick into my head. And I'd be even walking to the shops, I'd just be doing it over and over again. Any opportunity that is free real estate to practice, and uh, um, I'll make the most of it. Being in an Uber, repeating over in my head, walking to the shops. Because then that <laughs> way, it's not, it doesn't feel so like laborious because it's like, well, I'm doing this thing anyway. I can either just be like there away with the birds and the bees just in my head, just like thinking about anything. Or I can be using this time to practice. So it's like, that's what I would do. Any opportunity that I can be rehearsing this thing, I'll just be rehearsing it. And then so when it comes to the day, that foundation is set. So I can just, I can, my brain is open to, okay, we've got this set. I didn't really anticipate this to look like this. So how can we best use this to create something new? And so you're there in the day. So your, your brain is, your brain's not, oh fuck, I don't hope, I hope I don't fuck this up. It's, it's really just more like, okay, now I've got, I've got the space to build upon what we've already got. So... <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's just really about repetition for me. Anyway. Yeah, I do. I yeah. do know. Like, um, with that kind of repetition and teaching yourself how to memorize things like that, it definitely uh, continues to prime those neural pathways so that it becomes easier to memorize the next thing and the next thing. Which, when doing this, is the, operas, this, is, the, this is the really yeah. this is the funny thing. So, uh, since I've been in Canada, I've been testing my. Um, I've been doing a lot of brain tests where they they, they kind of measure the electrical activity of your brain. Huh, and uh -huh. MRIs and stuff like this and mm -hmm. they found that my memory was completely shot which I guess would would explain the fact mm -hmm. that my early years are all quite hazy in my brain but um the funny thing is I have a really good ability and I've always had it since I was really young and to the horror of my parents like <laughs> memorizing all of, all, all of Eminem's lyrics Ooh. after not many listens <laughs> and um like so so like I've always had that ability, but I, I, I agree with you. I think there's a particular part of my brain, even though on the whole, my memory is kind of fried by so many years of, of Lyme disease. Um, that area of my brain, I think is just, because I've been working it again and again and again and again, it, lyrics, lyric memory is something that comes quite easily to me. It's funny because if I go out on the street and say, oh, can I have directions for this place? By the time they've given the second direction, the sec it's like, okay, you turn left at the traffic light and then you walk for 500 meters. At that point, they might as well be talking French because it just doesn't, it doesn't, it's gone. After those first two years, I can't remember it. But um, for some reason, lyrics just, uh, they have a way of, of really staying with me. And I suppose it's because I've written them as well. So I'd be interested to know if because they hit on like an emotional pathway as well as a simple, just like linguistics pathway. Um, mm -hmm. it, it could be something to do with it. It's like when you see those uh, images of the brain when uh, m when music is added to it and all suddenly everything is like mm. glowing because the whole brain it, it, is it, activated it, it, and new pathways are yeah, emerging. I, <laughs> I saw that new, th that, I saw that same thing. And that's really, that's really interesting. It's like, <laughs> it's one of the only things that gets the whole brain fired up and working together like that. It's really beautiful to see music. So it could really be that. It could be because there's a musical element. Yeah. It, it almost takes the memory element into a different part of the brain and, and, and stimulates different regions of the brain, um, which may solidify it more into, into the memory. So yeah, this is super interesting. Okay. So I want to like piggyback on this into this 
very burning question that I have that I'm, I've been mulling this over in my brain so much, this idea that uh, I want to figure out like a better definition for what is singing. Um, and this makes uh-huh. sense because singing and voice, music, they're all my passion, but specifically how voices work, that is yeah. my passion. And mm. my brain has expanded to the idea that singing also includes harsh vocals. If I have a cookie monster that is sustaining some sort of phonation, it might not be phonation with the vocal folds, it might be phonation with some other piece of the vocal tract, but I think that's yeah. singing. But that's because it's sustained. So uh-huh. rap, which is admittedly, it's quite new. I've heard some Eminem and I liked Eminem in the past, um, but yeah. it's a new thing for me. I'm, and I'm trying to figure out, does rap qualify as singing? And if it does, should I be adjusting my definition of singing? And I want, I want your thoughts on this. Do you think rap is singing? I think I think rap is a drum. I think I think the difference is is uh, 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 the voice in terms of singing is an instrument, and and the rap is the drum. Because it, it, I think I started beatboxing before I started singing, <laughs> and, and I think that really helped in terms of coming up with different flows. Mm-hmm. Because you're you're essentially putting different different rhythmical patterns. And filling up the spaces. So you've got a beat and then you've got a melody for a backing track. And then it's really about putting, filling those spaces with different counter rhythms. So it's like, if I've got a beat, it's like, and then for, for my flow over the top of that, I'm essentially adding hi-hats with words. So it's like, uh-huh. and then I'm like, okay, cool, that works. Now I'm now I'm putting words to these to these rhythms and then I'm trying to, and the cool thing about rapping is there's, I think there's a lot more emphasis on wordplay. So yes. then you're putting, you're putting double meanings and slight accents on those hi-hats and, <laughs> uh, and maybe elongating certain ones. So there's an element of the, the singing that leak, leaks itself and lends itself to it. But I, I, I really see the difference as being rap. Rap is more of a drum and singing is more of an instrument. Okay, um, so rapping is your drum kit. And, yeah, and then think, singing, maybe singing is like the saxophone and then uh, harsh vocals are like distorted guitars. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and and, and the, 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 the interesting thing is that this ever, um, you, you can move into all of those things. You can add a little bit of distortion to a beautiful instrument. And you can you can move from rap into move from singing into rap and vice versa, and you can kind of it's, so it's almost like this um, singular cell organism that can just mutate into various different things at will, um, mm-hmm. which doesn't have the same limitations as an instrument in that respect. So uh, a- apart from when you have those crazy instrumentalists, will start drumming on their guitar and adding all the, the being a bit more inventive with what they're doing. But um, yeah, that, that's kind of the way that I see it. Um, in terms of the difference uh, of, of singing and rap. Mm-hmm. Do you, so, mm. and then I've noticed, oh man, there's so many questions I want to ask about this. Let's see. Let's stick to one at a time. Uh, I yeah. noticed that you are really deliberate with a lot of consonants, which also is mm-hmm. extremely exciting to my vocal nerd brain. Are you thinking yeah. often when you're designing where consonants are landing, are you thinking about that uh, rhythmic track that you described at the beginning of like, oh, I want to have a T that's going to be right there because it's going to have a little more of a hi hat kind of sound. Yeah, yeah, because it could be a snare, it could be a snare drum, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, so when you're when you've got a quite abrasive, um, abrasive s- sort of like choice of words, but be it be a consonant or a vowel. So if you if you're going more for a sort of a tacky consonant, it's like um, it helps t- t- it have that sharpness and it, and it helps the flow in in that respect. And the same with sort of like. A B internal rhymes where you have the first, the first few phrase rhyming with the, the first phrase of the second bar, and then the second phrase rhyming with the second. So, so it, it's like it is like a drum kit in that respect. Is that, that if you have an A B rhyme, the A is your is your kick drum and the B is your snare. So you the dum da dum da dum da. So the, the the first words can be, kind of sit like that. And um, yeah, I I really like that approach to. To, to hip hop, but I think it's, I've done it so many times now, it becomes sub perceptual. So I'm not there thinking, oh, this needs to be the sound. It's more yeah. that like this syllable lends itself well to this feeling. And you can still put them in unorthodox places and make them work. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it, it is all really just about counter rhythms and rhythms with, with rap, I think. That makes a lot of sense from how I've heard and analyzed your, your vocal lines before, meaning 
uh, both both rap and sung lines. Um, but mm. especially the rap has this underlying feeling of melody that's not as specific as your sung line, of course, where there's like a, yeah. a pitch center that's going ba 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 and mm -hmm. you get a low high, low high, and that makes so much sense that it would actually visually appear like a drum kit because we know that all those different mm. instruments also have different sort of pitch regions that they're hanging out in. Yeah. That's fascinating. Um, mm. <laughs> it actually it reminded me at one point of like a, a preacher. I once analyzed the speech patterns of a, a preacher and it had a similar thing. Preachers can rap. That would be fun. Yeah. And, and, um, and that's, the, that's the interesting thing about communication as well is that, mm -hmm. you know, you could, you could have two, two delivered beautifully written sermons for example, and delivered by different people or deli or just deli delivered with different tonality. And one of them might evoke a sense of empowerment and inspiration. And one of them might make you be like, oh man, what time does church finish, man? I need to get out of here, do you know what I mean? <laughs> and, 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 and really, and really it, it's, it's so interesting about the expression and tonality, mm -hmm. whether when someone is quite monotone or something's, you know, jumping all over the place and, um, yeah, it's kind of applying that. And, it, and it's funny when you're recording vocals, it's trying to escape that as well and, and mm -hmm. trying to find the take, the, trying to find the take that has that evocative <laughs> dance within it. So when you're, when you're in this space and, and you're writing a line and you're, you're starting to create a story, are you thinking uh, usually about the bigger picture of the story at this point and not about the the little, like, oh, how do I want this moment to feel? Are you thinking about the overall, like, I'm going to inspire all these people with this word or make them feel scared with this word? Does that make sense? Like, are no, you so I, I think, I, I think, I think mm -hmm. people, people don't really come into the creative process for me. It's, it's, I never really think about the intent of how the audience is feeling until maybe a little bit later on in the process mm -hmm. when we start getting more visual with it and trying to do more break the, th the fourth wall sort of style things with it. But in terms of the writing process, what I usually do is I, I'm writing sometimes free, freehand until I stumble across a concept and then I delete a lot of the things that I've already done and then try and the, the concept is the most important thing for me. So that's like the, that's the, the frame that holds everything. So once I have an idea, like with the tales, for example, it's like I have the idea, the story there, and then once the story's there, the lyrics are really just like lending themselves to the story. And that's the most overarching important thing. It's not about how the audience person feels. It's like, how can I best evocatively tell this story? And how can I best make these characters who don't exist in the physical realm, characters who exist in the physical realm for people who have heard the song or in the in the metaphysical. But it, it, it just really becomes about, yeah, re really about how I can best tell their story. Um, and then, and then it follows like, okay, we're putting the video together. What would be a really cool thing? So we got like the guitar shooting the camera in, in Screech's Tale and moments like that. I think they're such simple ideas. And this is coming back to making a story out of a little amount of clay. We've got a small budget, but that's such a cool idea that we've crafted that you can achieve on a phone. You know, like that idea of all it took was the camera wobbling and then falling down. <laughs> yeah. Richard was an officer who stood at six foot three Work in London on the night shift What he didn't think he'd see Was a boy running at him like an animal possessed With no time to hesitate He fired four bullets at Screech's chest Ah oh. Story, it ends right at the start. Young Screech and poor Jenny lying one street apart. An officer shaken by the boy that he claimed. Two bodies lay lifeless, and it's such a shame. And it's such a simple idea, but it. it it's almost just as effective as if a building had just exploded in the background. You know what I mean? Because it's With such amazing. a cool idea that people haven't seen many times. And I'm constantly, eternally searching for those simpler, but really moments that make you go, oh shit, that was really cool. Um, yeah, I, li I love ideas like that. It's like, it keeps coming back to that childlike notion you talked about before. It, I think 
it's the ideas that a, a child could come up with that it doesn't take this adult mind with a huge budget to come up with the things that really work. It should appeal yeah. to a kid. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. I love things like that. I really do. Yeah. Mm, I like that too. Um, so when you've been developing all this for quite a while, I know that I'd read that you developed your guitar playing by slowing clips down. I think of Jimi Hendrix. How did you uh -huh. develop this, this sort of rap rapping technique? Did you listen to Eminem and slow him down? No, it wasn't so much. Slow. I mean, I think a lot of the, the, the fast rap stuff was actually more inspired because Eminem wasn't doing so much of that back in those days. But I really had a a, a love of that from quite a young age. And um, it, it, it's, it's funny as well. I'll come back to touch on another point in a second. But uh, it was more that there was like M drum and bass MCs from the U UK. Like there was Skibbity, um, probably names that a lot, not a lot of people would have heard of and Leicester tapped into that world and he was like a legend in the drum and bass uh, mm. MC world. And, and, and people like that really like, was like, wow, shit. I thought it was really cool that like with the voice you can do these like crazy triplets and, and you know, like Buster Rhymes was doing it a little bit as well. Mm. Um, and, and for me, it was just really about the challenge. I, I really like when I can't do something, like with guitar or with my voice, because like, it's like the human is capable of doing these things, but I can't do it yet. And I've, I find that like, okay, cool. And then I get really excited about just doing it again and again and again. It's one of those things because it's, it's, it's funny because I'm like, with my ADHD, I find it quite hard to focus on anything particularly, but I've just hyper fixated on most things music. So I would just sit down, relentlessly slow down the metronome, do it as fast as I could, then set it to just where I can't and then pull it back a few BPM, do it. And then all of a sudden you realize, oh shit, I'm hitting like, 20, 30, 40 BPM faster than I'm doing now. So that's what I would do. Just again, repetition, just going over it and over it and over it, maybe for hours on end sometimes, just like just going over those same lines until I can actually do it. And um, yeah, I don't know. If, I, f I found something quite meditative within that process of just zoning out and just doing this. It's like chanting, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. like you're just repeating this phrase and you can kind of zone out. Um, but yeah, that, that's it. Again, it's just like repetition. Monotomy. Right. So uh, this actually, I have another question, but I just remembered you said you had a couple things you wanted to mention. So was there another thing from before you wanted to talk about? Oh, hang on. This is where my the memory thing comes in. <laughs> um, like, what did I want to talk about? Turn left. <laughs> oh, no, it doesn't matter. It'll come back to me at some point. <laughs> okay. Uh, so um, with tons of repetition in practice, uh, do you ever get vocally tired? Oh, a hundred percent. Um, and this is where like, so YouTube was basically my, my vocal coach. Um, so I hadn't had singing lessons. Uh, and I taught, I taught myself to sing pretty much mm -hmm. through YouTube because when I first used to go out busking, I had like really actually for a long time in my busking career, even when throughout the first half of the journey with the big push, I used to know that if I went busking on a Saturday, that means Sunday, Monday and Tuesday were written off in terms of being able to sing because I just, fuck my voice up because I, I was singing with Thanks. improper technique and mm -hmm. but the, the the challenge for me was I quite liked singing with improper technique because of how painful it felt for so when I was doing when I was going for the real solely sort of like weight on the <laughs> weight in the water style style vocals like I really liked that distortion and grip because it felt painful and that's how that's what I wanted to express I wanted to express that pain and you know it's it sounds great but it's like it wasn't good for the long longevity of my voice. And I noticed that my range now probably isn't what my range was when I was 26. I, I've listened to, to some vocal performances I did on the street. I'm like, fuck me, how did I hit that note and sustain it with such clarity? And um, mm. I, I think that just was from years of abusing my voice out on the street. And, um, you know, it, it is what it is. Maybe with time I'll be able to get that back. But it, it was noticing like, if I carry on like this, this range might just diminish even more and more with time. And you see that in a lot of singers. I mean, you, you see it in Sting, who's one of my favorite vocalists right now. He's just not, he's just not hitting those notes. But then you listen to somebody like Stevie Wonder and you're like, damn, man, you are singing this just as exceptionally as you were when you were in your 30s. And um, so for me, I wanted to be in the latter camp, not the former, because, you know, not, not that there's anything wrong with Sting's voice now. He's got such character. But before then, those really high soaring notes were what made me feel, fall in love with him and I, I wanted to because I think mine and his voice sit, sit in a similar frequency space 
I, want, I was really conscious of being able to, okay, I need to, so I lost my voice over the pandemic for improper technique for about six oh. weeks and it was a really scary thing. I thought I had nodules, but I went, I didn't have nodules, luckily. I just was abusing my voice. And um, at that point I, I did like a six, seven week course with this like opera singer teacher um, over <laughs> Zoom calls in the pandemic. Wicked guy called Stephen. Um, uh, Wait, Stephen, Stephen um, who? Uh, let me, let me Google it. Um, I want to get his neck because he deserves a big shout out because he's great. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm all about opera training, obviously. <laughs> Stefan Holstrom. But he's such a good, he's such a, um awesome guy. So it's Stefan Holstrom, um, dot co dot UK. Um, and he does online cool. vocal coaching. But he was, he was a real integral part of me being able to put my voice in a space where I wasn't because he was watching my technique in real time and, and showing me where I'm going wrong and, and what, Re resonating points of frequency in my head I can hit where I take the pressure off my throat mm -hmm. and how to support that with breath and stuff um which you'll know all about obviously um <laughs> but it, it really helped me it really helped me then get on convey that same feeling and have that same form of expression but without abusing my voice in the process so that was really good I love I love this idea um of like there's a, a wanting to hold on to the feeling I think for for yourself like as a singer you feel like if I feel pain that's going to express pain um mm. and I remember having that early on so much as well especially yeah. as like a very dramatic opera singer coming from that direction like I will if I feel drama I will express drama and then sometimes sure. that equated to lots of pushing and mm. uh and then later on I had a coach tell me um, maybe you're trying to hold on to that feeling for you. And what you need to do is release it and let your audience feel it instead. And that suddenly yeah. turned everything around this idea of I can feel it, but let it flow. I don't need to hold the feeling. I need to let it flow out and let my audience feel it for me. And that, I don't know, it just like changed everything. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then it's like less less is more. How do you operate on like 70% while still conveying the same emotions and being in that space? And I suppose it's like having a conversation, you know, like you can you can get you can speak really emotively in such a way that's not necessarily shouting your point at somebody, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and still get the it's almost within that subtlety and pulling back, you can create <laughs> more of that feeling because you're allowing yes. the space for it to be rather than it being an assault. And there are times when assault is necessary but yeah i, I, th I think that's it's, it's more like the nuance and the subtleties of like <laughs> just letting things leak in there in little mm -hmm. moments so be like if i don't use my belt voice for the whole song but only at this one little moment then that's actually going to be more impactful because you're taking people on a journey to get to that destination you're not just being like bam there's the destination the whole time you know yeah absolutely i think uh, maynard and in, in tool is one of the best examples of able to convey so much intensity with his lyrics and, and the vocal quality and he'll bring it into a, a like more quiet space a lot of times and then yeah. there'll be a moment where he just unleashes and it feels glorious yeah yeah that's what i love about smashing pumpkins and bands like that as well that is like they do it very well <laughs> that's a that's a band i've yet to get into but i think they have a hilarious name <laughs> yeah oh they're they're, they're so good I, I went to watch them um in LA the last time that I was there and um man like the the the, the front man Corgan he's the Danny Corgan he's he's like I don't know there was some there's someone about him he came out like looking like Nosferatu and, you know because I follow I'd fo I'd follow them since the 90s but recent, it, but it's just like it almost felt like you were at a cult like meeting and he was he came out there delivering his like manifesto his performance kind of felt like that it was just, just so captivating man he was such a good front man but he um yeah, his voice is still phenomenal. And, it, and it, he's the same thing. He, he really comes down to deliver that sort of like emotive, like soft delivered vocal. And then he'll just like go into like a very distorted going for it. And it just, yeah, it was, it was so cool, man. I love, mm -hmm. I love, yeah. Really cool. Oh, that's neat. That's, that's awesome. I'm excited to check them out at some point. Yeah. Probably sooner. Are you going to be anything for Halloween? Do you dress up? Um, I'm... <laughs> I haven't decided yet, actually. I think we're going to be, we're not, I'm not going to be in Canada because me and Connor and um, Josh, we're going to go to LA. Then we're going to go to Vegas. I think we're in, I think we're in Vegas for Halloween, which is going to be a quite Oh my gosh, that's going to be fun. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. But I haven't thought about the costume yet. We'll see. We'll see when we get there. But I do like to dress up. <laughs> I think it just makes it feel more fun a lot of times. It'd be great. Yeah. Um, it'll be say- it'll be interesting to see if anyone now that there's so much more exposure and everything. I'm sure that I'll get uh, tagged in some pictures of people dressing up as the of the various dysfunctional characters that I've invented. <laughs> there's gonna be a pig somewhere. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, there's gotta be. Yeah, yeah. Right. Ah. Yeah. Okay, well, I uh, I have just one. I have two other questions for you, and then we're going to get to sure. some patron questions. Man, patrons came up with some amazing questions. Um, cool. But uh, first question is, are there any specific warm-ups that you do, especially for rep? I, I want to know, other than repetition, like, is there any other way that you're mm-hmm. working for things in your practice? I, for rap, I don't normally warm up for the, my rap stuff, but I, I, th- I think it, I just, it's, it's a case of warming up by doing. For singing, I warm up for um, a good a good hour Ooh. to an hour and a half before like a show or before a busking performance. Just um, just the usual, you know, like starting with lip rolls, then going on to humming, then going on to scales. Um, but I'll, I'll normally wait until my voice is. I'm not one of those people blessed with just I can just fall into it and have this superb pitch and clarity it takes me along a little while to get there so i'll normally i normally yeah do about an hour hour and a half of vocal warm-ups mm-hmm. i love that you yeah. mentioned the lip rolls and the humming first because those are sovt exercises semi-occluded vocal tract exercises which is yeah. like in all of the science and data we have that is one of the best ways to warm up your voice and that made me really excited yeah <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> like, yes. no, I do it. and the interesting thing is as well um it actually stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system <laughs> so um so it's actually really good for my health to be because i'm i'm one of my diagnoses is this uh, this autonomia which means that i'm stuck in a, 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 a my default state is fight or flight um which, mm. which is because oh of having an infection for so long so it means that I, i'm constantly in in a state of fight or flight so singing is one of those things which now makes sense with busking sometimes i'd go into busking feeling really foggy and come out of it feeling a lot better um singing is one of those things that's constantly stimulating the vagal nerve so you're you're um you're constantly putting yourself after a long time of singing in, in a parasympathetic state rather than sympathetic. So you're more like rest and digest, you're more. So it's actually really health beneficial as well to be doing these warm ups. So sometimes even if I'm not singing, it's just like I'll do it to get myself. If I'm particularly brain foggy or something, it's almost like a cardio workout for me. It just helps me feel a bit more calm and centered. Mm-hmm. I I yeah. love that you're talking about that because that's that's like one of the reasons why I tell people they should sing. Is because it's yeah. good for your brain. It's good for your health. One of the number yeah. one things that's recommended to people that are struggling with anxiety or depression is to go join a choir. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's, it definitely thing. helps. It's, it's good in a lot of ways, I think. Gosh, yeah. yes. And and thank mm. you, Vegas Nerve. It is, there's so little still known, but we do know that it is so helpful if you just sing and hum, especially to get that yeah. stimulated, then it it triggers all of that emotional processing to calm down <laughs> yeah no exactly oh, that's so cool ah, yeah. singing is magical well it's, it's yeah it's it's magical i think if i were to talk about casting a spell on somebody um i definitely think music would be the real way to do it today <laughs> yeah well there is there is something magical about it, it, it it's so interesting how you like it kind of opens a, a bit of an empathy window for people um there's something about singing something that you would say in a way that just kind of hits differently. E- even over poetry, you know, there's some poetry that's really moved me, moved me, but there's something about singing where you're conveying that same message through melody that really does cut through. It's almost like a bit of a Trojan horse of an, of the thing that you're mm. trying to deliver. I, I, I love it, the Trojan horse analogy, actually, because it's like you can say something through a song that if you said it in conversation might sound a bit preachy that makes somebody turn off. But if you say it through a song with a catchy melody, it's it almost like incepts that point because it's it's delivered in in a way that's more sonically pal- palpable, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm. I think of, I I think that we've actually evolved to respond more to a singing voice. Uh, if you take a look at like essentially how various 
uh, animal hearing and, and our hearing how things have shifted. We've evolved to respond more to human speech or to like a baby crying, for example. We emotionally just yeah. respond more to that. Imagine, so, imagine a parallel universe where something in the process of like inventing language went a little bit more left field and everyone just <laughs> communicated in song like a musical. <laughs> <laughs> like that was just like the, the default the default thing that everybody did so like, good morning <laughs> right. did, just, you'd, you'd all of a sudden feel like you're in some like sound of music i think uh, alternate elizabeth is like so even happier in that universe <laughs> <laughs> yeah i love it okay this other question um i think you would have so much fun insight on I like to ask artists what's their favorite venue that they've ever sung in. And a lot of times these are people that have been out on the road and have sung in all of these incredible concert halls. And mm. I'm really curious what your answer is going to be because you've sung in abandoned buildings and you've busked everywhere. So yeah. you have a very different experience performing in various venues. Which one has been your favorite? Mm. I think I think it's honestly, um, I think it's honestly busking because there's just so much about it. A, I can, when you're in these little street spaces and the sound is reverberating back to you, bouncing off the walls and coming back to you, particularly in the spots that we chose. And we used to choose spots for that very reason because of the acoustics of the space. So you, we've got our busking amp. I can I can be fiddling with the EQ in real time, so I'm not relying on a sound guy because a sound guy can be a make or break thing. You know, sometimes you get a really bad sound guy and it kills you on stage, but... I can just be tweaking this in real time and be like, ah, oh, this is a bassy part. I'm going to quickly twist the knob and put a bit more bass into my voice to make it really bassy. <laughs> and, um, but, but I love, I love the immediate feedback that you have and that, that removal of the separation of stage audience. Cause they're right there. So it's, it's, it's a, it kind of feels like a much more shared experience. And, and for me, and also as well, all the people who choose to stop are doing that by free will. Whereas if come, someone comes to a concert, they're still obviously choosing to come to your concert from free will. But once they're there, they're there. And they're all people who know your music. Whereas on the street, you're essentially winning people over by your performance. So the people who choose to stop, who are witnessing what you're doing, they're all there just because they were drawn in by the sound in that very moment of your performance. And, um, for me, that's really exciting. It's really exciting. And the whole spectrum of age becomes blurred because you're just out on the street. So you're reaching a much more diverse audience than the sort of people who buy concert tickets as well. Um, and for me, that's really beautiful. And it just kind of feels a lot more from a person to a person, not this is the artist on the pedestal and this is the audience. It, it, it's, it's really a much more equal ground. And um, for me, I, I, it helps my performance because that's you know music back in the day in a long time ago you have you know it's really about you're sort of like minstrels and bards telling stories in a pub and everyone sat around that pub to listen to the story and <laughs> it just feels like this kind of very human thing as opposed to oh my god you're so much better than i am and you're on the stage <laughs> and i love you so much I have my babies it's like that's kind of almost removed that's like that's kind of like removed a little bit and it's just a it's a lot more human I, I feel quite um i'm like an eternal like extrovert introvert so i, I feel i the second i stay, step out of ren performer mode i i um I, I kind of just like to be left to my own devices and uh, I, it's always made me quite uncomfortable after shows if you have so, if you have so many people like oh my god oh my god sign this it's like it, 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 <laughs> I, I feel a little bit it's not it's not because so, I was thinking about this not, it's not so much like imposter syndrome of not deserving it I just kind of I see the whole thing as quite a curious thing that humans do um, because yeah I, it's not, it, it, you know I, I appreciate that I've moved people in such a way that they want to come and tell me how much I've moved them but um sometimes it can just get a little bit much because I am just a person doing these things. And um, I, I like to just have a, a person to person chat rather than to be put on any sort of pedestal for what I'm doing. Um, Cause it's just a certain, uh, certain cir circumstances and situations have led me to this point. And it's just what I've chosen to do and pour myself into. So it's, 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 it's a funny one, the world of celebrity and, and as things grow, it's probably the most, the, the, the part that I'm looking forward to the least actually I get yeah. that <laughs> yeah respect massive respect for you there well okay we've got some uh some really great patron questions so I'm gonna um go through some of these we've got from Joe I'd love to ask about your collaborations with Chinchilla Love 
about those. Mm-hmm. Okay. You two singing together are a special kind of magic akin to Floor and Marco from Nightwish. Have you both considered maybe doing an entire album together or more collaborations? We, we definitely will do more collaborations together. Um, like, yeah, me, me and Chinchilla um, have just got a really good bond and friendship. Um, mm-hmm. and, and she was, you know, when I first saw her performing at this great escape festival that I was performing at, this is years ago, I just remember being like super, super blown away by her. And then I ended up for a little while working with the management that she was under. And, um, and we both ended up leaving that management for very complex reasons, um, frustrating reasons. But um, we, we um, within that, we formed, I don't know, just like this this mutual respect for what each other was doing because I think we approached things in quite a similar way, but just at different ends of the spectrum. Like she's just ferocious, ferociously <laughs> feminist and, 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 and unapologetic, which is beautiful. And I think I'm ferociously touching on a darker side of the human psyche and experiences uh, experiences and being unapologetic about it but little by little bit by bit i'm pushing back down with a new habit if not for long just for a while i bury myself with a great big smile And um, I think when we get together creatively, there's this really exciting, um, you know, because she's talking about the adversity she feels as a woman and, and she's bringing a, shining a lot of light on that in a way that I think is really inspiring and empowering to a lot of women out there that are like, fuck yes, go on. Do you <laughs> know what I mean? And it's, so, it's, it's such vital work that needs to be done. And I think that's an that's, uh, integral part of her success at the moment. When, when she released Little Girl Gone, it was just like an anthem for... Um, for a lot of a, a lot of women out there that needed that empowerment, so big her big her up for doing that, and um and I for, for me I suppose there's this almost parallel journey of, of of doing the same thing for the the chronic health community of people and mental health community of people going through those things, and yeah it was, I think I think the, there's just like there's a pretty beautiful synergy there, and um the the beautiful thing was me and her both stepped away from this management situation. We both had a lot of phone calls after that time where we were both feeling really lost really upset really like fuck where what what do we do now and then we both decided to move in a very independent way devoid of a manager and both of us within the space of a year um have achieved like you know with that song she was number one all over the world and um it was i was so happy for her almost to the point where it felt like my own success because i know what she had been through because i'd been through exactly the same thing and um and vice versa with me um we i i've just you know come off the back of landing the number one uk record and i'm i'm sure i'm sure our old management <laughs> are kicking themselves but um it feels really nice to be <laughs> to have done that off the um off our own off our own work and our own sweat because uh, uh, we both are in a very similar place and yeah i mean and we both talk, we, it's so funny how, how much our journeys parallel each other because we're both now working, we're, we're both now in a much better home for what we're doing and exploring the options of potentially, because I'm not totally against the idea of, of having new management on board and, and I, I'm, I'm, ta- I'm in this trial period with this absolutely amazing manager at the moment um, oh, and, and we'll see where that lands up and it's just really nice. And, and then just Connor, who um, people have come to know and love, who, yep. who works alongside me. Is, is basically taking on a management role and has essentially taken on that role for months as well. And um, he's just smashing it. And, and he, he's like, so he's so good. And he's, he, he cares about it to the point where, I mean, if you watch the video of us celebrating for that number one, he's like, he's in tears himself. And that, and that's, I think that's the passion that I love to have around me, you know? Yeah. People who actually care like really yeah. about you personally. Really I think care. it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's because it's like my success is their success and my achievements are their achievements. It's it's not just, oh, Raul Ren's done this thing. It's like, we've done this thing and it's and it feels incredible. And for me, I like success shared is so much. I, I feel yes. like if that moment had happened and I'd been sat in a room by myself and I'd find out the news, I probably wouldn't I, have been anywhere near yeah. as happy. 
I think like for me, the very, very quick growth of my YouTube channel, just going zhoo, and then getting mm. support from a team, eventually establishing a really great team central. Uh, it's amazing whenever there is success, we feel it very much within our team. And then there's even this greater sense of gratitude um, to community because I'm sure you feel that too with with Hira and how it just it touched so many people and so many people then shared it. And you have this yeah. community come together that has similar values. Um, I love the way my community is so positive. Um, they come to appreciate good music together, right? And they come to lift each other up together. So I have so much gratitude for uh, the team and the larger community that made it all possible. A hundred percent. There's there's a one of my favorite scenes like that I think summarizes all this. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen that movie Into the Wild about Alexander Supertramp who goes off. He gets, it's about this guy who kind of breaks free from the shackles of society and decides he wants to go and move, live out in Alaska and just, he burns all of his money. Mm. He gets rid of all his belongings and he just goes out on the road and he's just going to make his way as he goes. And um, he's got this, this, this idea in his head that I have to, I have to just break, I'm going to be happy. Life is going to be great when I'm in Alaska and I'm just living out in wild. I'm living out in nature and there's nobody there with me because then I, I can truly be free. And then he, and then he arrives, um, maybe skip forward five minutes uh, for anybody <laughs> listening who doesn't want to know the end. But he <laughs> arrives, he, he arrives at the, um, uh, is, 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 I, I know I truly reckon it's one of my favorite films of all time, but he arrives at this bus that he finds, this old abandoned bus out in nature and he's away from everybody. And he accidentally eats these poisonous berries and, um, and, and falls really, really sick and he becomes too weak to hunt. So he can't, he can't actually forage for food and stuff. And his, this is based on a true story based on the journals that they found of this guy. And um, his take home message was that actually happiness feels much more tangible and real when it's happiness shared. So, so he, he died alone and, and uh, just, just out there in the wild. And, and, and his, he really came to this realization that he was kind of running from the thing that, actually solidifies happiness which is this true feeling of community and this true feeling of belonging and of sharing a moment of joy well that's what that's what i took from it at least anyway um and i think it's really true man i, I think and it's why that i so ferociously uh it, try to preach collaboration and try so ferociously try and when i collaborate with people i won't necessarily do it do it for what it can do for me and my career i think a lot of people particularly when I've been over to LA and stuff, operate in this place of, oh, you've got 100,000 followers, you've got a million followers, you seem like a really good person to be friends with. Mm. And I think that's so like, I don't know, when you're trying to collaborate for the sense of your own benefit, it really it kind of strips it of its humanity a little yeah. bit for me. So for me, it's why a lot of the collaborations that I've done have been with people who don't have really any social media presence. It's just someone that I've heard and gone, wow, that moves me so much. And um, uh, and then my success becomes their success as well. And it, it feels really nice that people who I think are very deserving of attention then start getting it. But um, it's just about those shared moments and being able to, I don't know, bring people into this world where mm -hmm. you can share these moments of celebration. Because uh, I think we are very, we're wired to be very social creatures. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree. There's a, the shared and, and there's, 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 but there's a paradox within that because we're we're wired to be very social, and and I think these moments of joy, like when I when I celebrated this number one with my friends, there was such a moment of joy between all of us. But we're, paradoxically, we're told, and it's drilled into us from all angles, from media, from school, from that we have to be the best. I have to be number one. I've got to be the best in this field and I've got to be, which is why we, we, the, 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 it was never really about the number one for me or having one up over anybody else. It was always just about the significance of what, how that related to my illness, if that makes sense. Cause it's mm. like, it's a real point where you can say, okay, this point in time I did this. And five years ago I was unable to pick up a guitar. So it's a real, like, there's a real, like landmark there it's not really about so i don't know if i'd necessarily feel the same about it if i hadn't been through all my illness because um it's really funny initially the distribution company i was working with um uh the, the entertainment company other songs they said to me you can either sell this album through these guys and then it's registered for the chart or we can release it independently 
through you guys selling the CDs. And my, my first thing was like, oh, I don't care about charts. Let's just do it independently because mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's more streamlined. We've got control of it. Let's just do it like this. Uh-huh. And then um, and then they convinced me to, 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 to go down the chart route. And I did in the end. But it was, it was never really my on my um, radar of really, <laughs> I didn't really want it. I, the moment that I wanted it was last week, which is funny. Like, it, <laughs> right. it was like, when, when someone was like, you could get a number one record, I was like, oh, fuck, I really want a number one record. I didn't know that I did. And then, and then I started promoting it quite aggressively. So it's really funny noticing that in myself and then almost like noticing the hop- hypocrisy within myself to really want this thing. Uh, and noticed I'm not immune to all this conditioning of wanting this thing now of being like, fuck, I could be the top selling artist in the UK. That's incredible. And um, yeah, kind of like an acknowledging that there was still this like big part of my ego that then really wanted that in that moment. And then I got it, but then I got it and things still, I'm really happy and really grateful, but things still very much the same thing that I, I suppose they have as much meaning as we attribute to them. You know, I, one of the things I like about you is that you, I actually seem like you follow one of uh, the sayings that I go by, which is to be flexible in your approach, be rooted in your values, and be clear in your intentions. And I like the yeah. way you know what your values are. You just describe like you are rooted in values of um, essentially this this journey of creating in the moment of, uh, I think, of really reaching a community of people that have had a lot of struggles with mental health. Um, but mm. the moment you found out there's this, this number one thing, you're like, yeah. I want that. I do want that. But you're clear yeah. about your intentions and, and wanting it and and knowing that even though you want it, that's that's still not part of your root values there. And then all along mm. you've been flexible in your approach. It's just it's like it's really awesome. I think you live well. <laughs> yeah, I, well and I and I'm noticing, you know, because in in the high high rent thing, there's like this never chase number statistics or stats, which people constantly remind me of all the time. Um, <laughs> but like there's there's that thing and and it's but then also within within that song, it's it's about these two polar sides of yourself at war, and and I, I think I think it's true. I I, th- I think that, um, yeah, I'm definitely not I'm definitely not immune to those more egotistical desires. I don't think any of us are, to be honest. Uh, and, and it's the same with like I can, it, I mean, the chorus of Money Game. Um, Point, there's a line in it you'll see I won't ruin the song but the, the line in it is like <laughs> point the mirror at ourselves we're all part of this old money game so it's me actually preaching what I see to be the the downsides of capitalism there are a lot of upsides mm. to capitalism but the downsides to it and um and realizing that I'm complicit within that system I'm, so it's like I'm criticizing something that I'm contributing to oh rain 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 a storm it comes our way and those who rise through distorted lines Poison in the veins But we die to point the blame, 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 blame It's easy and to blame But point the mirror at ourselves We're all part of this old money game Stop mm-hmm. and, um, and being aware of that paradox of humans I think we're all We all have the propensity to be self-contradictory by nature um, and, and to be hip- hypocritical and, and some we're, we're really good at pointing out someone else's hypocrisy without acknowledging our own so you, you could have you could have somebody at a party preaching veganism really quite militantly and then they go and do a line of cocaine off the table the, the, where, where the industry is also contributing to the, the suffering of people to the d- destruction of, of land um, so it's it's like that, uh, or shopping with a plastic bag. Something as simple mm-hmm. as that. It's it's really difficult to not be, to have a core value, and not be a hypocrite in some sort of way. Even the clothes that we wear, the technology that we use. If you trace back the line, you'll find some kind of exploitation of either nature or humanity, um, just by the nature of the whole infrastructure that we've set up. But I think it's important to acknowledge that hypocrisy and still push for the values that you believe in, realizing that you are a hypocrite by yeah. nature, you have but to still be pushing humble. for your values whilst acknowledging that because someone will pull you up on something and sometimes you won't have an answer for it. But I think we can still do all we can to shift that pendulum in, in, in t- more into the way of light, which is what I try to do with my work. Gosh, that's good. <laughs> that's mm. really good. Uh, let's see. Richard V wrote, 
as a writer, you've earned the moniker Bardcore, indicative of <laughs> Shakespearean tragedy overtones present in your work, particularly the tales of Jenny and Screech. Uh, there's yeah. a few questions here, so I'll, I'll list them off and we can kind of dive into where you would like to. Could you discuss sure. how the works of Shakespeare influence your style of storytelling and which of his plays hold the greatest impact on you as a writer? Are there other playwrights mm -hmm. who have also influenced and shaped the way you craft your stories? And was it busking in theater that influenced the decision to film one-shot videos? So <laughs> some things wrapped okay. up in there all together. Yeah, cool. I'm going to have, you're going to have to tell me the last two questions again. This is the directions <laughs> thing again. But the, the first, the first one, um, I really liked how Shakespeare, the stories didn't always end happily. It's not a happily ever mm -hmm. after. Mm -hmm. And, and the divine tragedies and comedies, um, the, the, the wit, the wordplay, the metaphors, I, I think, I think they're fantastic. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not going to sit here and lie and pretend I'm as educated on Shakespeare as most because I'm not you know I, I've only I've only come across in terms of an in-depth way the, the, the most well-known ones like Macbeth and um, Midsummer Night's Dream and, and um, Romeo and Juliet and The Tempest as well actually but other than that I haven't I'm not like a well-read fan of Shakespeare but but the ones that I do know I really like that and I really like the the development of the story and really like the tale of Jenny and Screech is a bit of a Romeo and Juliet in a, in a way, even though it's not a tale of love. Um, it's the end. It, it's such a like, I know it's, it's quite Freudian in a way as well. It's, it's like you, the, the siblings and the duality between these siblings and the fact that Screech kills his sister without knowing that it's his sister. Sorry, spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't seen very that. very Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> But but, yeah. but, the, but the whole thing with with Violet and and, and going back in time, it, it's um it's rounded up in this really quite morbid yet beautiful way. Poor Violet, she was nine months gone. Turning to the doctor, Violet broke her silence and she cried. If I'm to die right here tonight, please let my baby stay alive. The doctor soon regained composure, called the surgeon to come in. As Violet's world turned to black, the curtains closed, the lights went dim. In London City, far from pretty, 2005. A lady down in Paddington, just lost the fight to stay alive A tragedy or a miracle It happened on these very streets Two twins aligned side by side A girl named Jenny And a boy named Screech And I think there was a lot of morbidity and beauty in what Shakespeare was doing um, mm -hmm. And, I, and I, I love that because life is ugly. It's really ugly sometimes. And there, and it's really beautiful within the ugliness of it. Yeah. So it, I, I, think, I think throughout my work, that's been quite a central theme is, is, the, is the beauty of ugliness sometimes. Yep. And what about and, other playwrights that have influenced you? Um... I think it's more film than play, to be honest. I, I, again, uh -huh. the, the, the world, because people have always asked me if I've come from like a theater background and I just haven't. And I haven't seen a huge amount of theater either. It's, it, I, th I think somehow, um, I think more like I, um, my mum used to take me to a lot of these um, like storytelling, really small festivals where you'd hear a lot of like Celtic stories and a lot mm. of um, <laughs> uh, beautifully told just folk stories. That, that go back, you know, years and years and years. And I loved these stories. And my mum used to uh, read me some of these before I'd go to sleep as well. And um, like the story of Branwen, my little sister was named after Bran Branwen, who's led the story of this uh, Welsh princess where this, they use this giant as a bridge between them for, for all the soldiers to walk up. But I, I used to love these sorts of stories. And um, I really took a lot of inspiration for that. And I really took a lot of inspiration just from the world of film, um, and, and usually my favorite directors are some of the darker ones. Uh, like I love Stanley Kubrick stuff. I love Guy mm. Ritchie. I love T Quentin Tarantino. I love Martin McDonough. Um, and I love how their stories as well are pretty, they're, they're almost like modern Shakespearean tragedies in a way. <laughs> like not a lot of them end well. Um, and I, and I, I love the, I don't know. I loved it. And I love the char charisma within a lot of the anti-heroes of those worlds. Cause they're so complex. I feel like, the anti-hero is a more interesting character than the hero. So for me, the Joker is a more interesting character than Batman. 
Oh, because yeah. Because he's the complexity of... And I love villains who... It's like Thanos in uh, in the Avengers. I love <sighs> villains where you kind of get their point and you kind of emphasize their point. And there was that scene... I don't know how much of a Marvel nerd you are, but there's that scene where Thanos is just sitting there like feeling defeated and sad. He's just like, I, I was doing this for you. Like, that's what you don't understand. Like eradicating half the life in, 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 in the universe is because you guys are fucking it up. <laughs> like <laughs> you're so destructive and you're so parasitic that um, I'm really giving you an opportunity to reset. And, and the Joker was more, was more about anarchy, but it was anarchy based on injustice. I thought that um, uh, Joaquin Phoenix did an amazing job of really bringing across that empathy in the Joker film where it's like, it's really, I am just a chemical byproduct of what you all are. I'm a manifestation of the way that we live. I'm not a villain. I'm not trying to destroy the way that you live. I am your, ch I am the child of the way that we live because it's, I, and I thought that was beautiful how like that film showed the downtrodden nature of the, the, the downtrodden, the, 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 the mental health, the, the, the poverty, all of those people resonated with the Joker's message so much at the end, right there, there was this huge uprising because all of these people felt, suddenly felt seen. And I think those, those antiheroes are very interesting because there's, there's a real point to what they're doing. It's just that the, the outcome is potentially a little bit misguided depending mm -hmm. on how much you value human life <laughs> because it's really it's really that valuement of human life that decides is there a way where we can preserve human life and put ourselves on the right course or by nature are we just destructive and is it like you trim a bush this is making me sound like a psychopath is, is there a way that <laughs> if you trim a bush and and it helps the the vegetation flourish because you're controlling it I'm not, I'm not um, vouching for genocide, by the way, <laughs> but, 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 but it's just really interesting to try and understand how those human beings, not necessarily, if we're relating the Joker and we're relating Thanos to times in history where you've had somebody come across and say, this is the solution and it, and it lies somewhere within a very dark solution that touches on things like genocide and stuff like that. It's like, obviously villainizing them for it because i don't i don't believe that that is a solution but understanding why in their mind they would arrive at that point yeah and, and do they do they value the do they value the survival of the species and never never from a point where i think like people like hitler are excluded from this because that's that's a selectivity of a certain skin pigmentation and uh type of people and then everybody else is wrong which i think that's so so misguided in so many levels but when it's the thanos situation where it's like the whole we want to randomly eradicate half the life on this planet randomly because then we can build a better future it's like people that come from it like that it's like if you value human life or if you or if you value the survival of and betterment of our species what you can almost kind of see where that character came to that point do you know what i mean but and that's like, what makes it a great villain is that you have some sort of empathy for them. Yeah, it's it's very it's very strange. So it's like, how can you reach that point whilst mm -hmm. maintaining the hero's journey and the hero's <laughs> journey, the hero's journey in Avengers is how do we how do we save as many people as possible in this moment? We're not thinking ahead, but in this very moment, how do we save as many lives as possible? That's the hero's journey. Then, so it's like, how can you become the hero and the anti-hero? Like, how can you have the values of somebody who wants to make a better world in the future whilst still being the hero and save as many lives as you can in the present? Which it, is a, it's a head scratcher. Yeah, exactly. Oh, man. Oh, that's a, I feel like that conversation, we should just like go down it like way more in the future because whole. Yeah, so like, uh, I'm going <laughs> off on big tangents here. I have a tendency to do this. No, I love, I love that. Uh, it's such a great. Uh, just a fun, fun thing to philosophize about and and discuss all the angles of it. So I get very excited mm. about that too. <laughs> um, okay, so let's see. Jeff uh, Koftanoff said, <laughs> "I love this. Are you actually really a non-human entity who gains power by making human people <laughs> cry?" <laughs> yes, I feed off your. I feed off your tears. <laughs> Every time somebody cries, I become a little bit stronger. There is that thing though when you see somebody cry where you're like, yeah, I did it. 
<laughs> like, Cry for me. Right? <laughs> You're like, I got your emotions. Mission yeah, accomplished. I'm, bo- I'm, I'm, I'm bottling them all up and I'm storing them in this huge cylinder and I'm building a super <laughs> machine. I, I won't tell you my intentions for it yet, but it will soon be revealed. That's amazing. I love that. Jason Pressler says... When I listen to your music, it sounds to me like these start out as poems and you later turn them into music. What method do you use to write the initial song? Hmm. I think it's, I think it's, it's, it's quite difficult for me to answer that because it's quite a thoughtless process. Um, Cause I, I normally like, I'll normally start with a melody actually. I'll, I'll normally start with a feeling. So it, uh, I'll have chords over a guitar that I've, or a piano. I, it usually starts with a piano and guitar. And then I try and, feel out the feeling of what that's doing and then I, I'll come up with a melody over the top and then I put the words to it. So it, it never usually starts with words to melody, which is interesting because uh, Anthony Kiedis from the Red Hot Chili Peppers writes his words first and then puts a melody to it or Fashante will put a melody to it for him. And um, for me, it's never, it's always, it's been the opposite of that. It's normally the melody comes first because then that's the feeling and then the mm-hmm. words then will try and re- emphasize that feeling and lend themselves to the feeling. So I'm normally just humming gibberish or words that aren't made up yet. And sometimes a word will just fall out of that. So if I'm just like singing nonsense words in the melody and in the, in the rhythm that I want them to, a word will just appear kind of like out of the ether. And, mm-hmm. and then that will set the precedence for what the song's about. I think that this uh, lyrics or melody uh often people call it a struggle, but the idea of which one comes first and which one takes priority, this has existed for mm. as long as if we, as long as we've had any sort of vocal writing. You can see it from the birth of opera, like back 400 years ago, and you can see in different phases of opera which one was taking priority and, and look at composers and, and librettists as well and see which one was coming first. And uh, the the greatest have figured out how to combine them so that they have equal weight, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I agree. I agree. Yeah, yeah. I I, th- I think um, I, you know, and sometimes you can have words devoid of real any real meaning. They just have such a good melody that you can't help. I mean, I mean, a lot of the, the chart music is like that. You know, they're they're, they're oh, written yeah. by a team <laughs> of like eight eight people in a room who are just trying to really perfectly construct the most catchy pop song with the most memorable universally relatable lyrics but i've never really i've never really taken that approach i've, I've never i've never none of my lyrics have ever been written by anybody else it's, it's always mm-hmm. just been myself and and any time that i've been told by the industry that i at times that i've worked within it i've tried out i think i tried out two in total of like a songwriting session and both times it just didn't i don't know it just felt it didn't feel right for me mm. to be mm-hmm because because my songs are so personal yeah um the, the only time that it becomes collaborative is if i'm working say when i'm working with chinchilla or when i was working with sam and we both have suggestions for each other's lyrics and words um but other than that because we're creating that together it feels more it makes more sense in that scenario i think for me anyway mm-hmm. personally yeah of course it has to be from both of you yeah <laughs> yeah um Arnout wants to know, with your openness and advocacy for mental health, you have many neurodiverse fans with labels like autism, ADHD, etc. Do you write any of your songs with this part of your audience in mind? Uh, no, again, no, no. I never, I never really write with my audience in mind. I, I always just, I, I kind of write for myself first and foremost. And um, yeah, uh, and then people can take from it and relate to it however they do. Um, I mm-hmm. suppose my music is connecting with people with that uh, uh, with more neurodiverse group is because um, I, I, a lot of those things I've either been misdiagnosed with or I'm officially diagnosed with. So um, I suppose it relates on that level, but just because it is my life experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You're telling your story and, and because it's so real and so you, uh, I think that you're human and everybody else is human. So, so many humans are going to relate. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, Benjamin Hall wants to know, has increased fame impacted your mental health journey, either by fear or increased peace by seeing what a difference you've made in so many lives? Um, I think, 
I think because I'm living in Canada, it's, it's uh, most of it exists on the microcosm that is the internet. And um, I, I, more and more I'm being like recognized here, but not to the point where it, it stops me from living any sort of life. I'm still relatively uh, underground here, I suppose. Um, <laughs> it's, I think it's more just, there's a lot more, I don't think it's really changed my sense of inner peace um, but I think there's definitely more work that has to be done that's separate from music in a way. And that's why I'm trying to build the teams of people around me to yeah. take care, take that weight off my shoulders um, in terms of posting things on social media, you know, helping with engagement and uh, almost being like this micro universe of lots of things that we were talking about this the other day is like, we've got my mate Joe and Vic and they're doing their thing on YouTube of like all these little adventures and stuff like that. And then we've got, artists that I've collaborated doing their own things. So there's almost like all these branches of, of things that can keep people kind of inside this universe. Mm -hmm. um, and that really helps. But it, it, I think the, the main thing that has changed is just there's a lot more to interact with. Or like if I open my inbox, it's like 10 times the amount of messages that I used to get last year. <laughs> and, and it's just simply, it's just simply too much to engage with. So I think I've been, a, I, I've had to rethink the way that I approach things like community so now i'll do like twitch streams rather than just reply to people one-on-one -on -one. and also because of the nature of the, what i'm doing there's a lot of trauma dumping um and i have to really stay quite detached from that on an emotional level because i'm i think i'm an empath by nature so i get a lot of stories of like really personal deep stories because i guess people relate to my story of adversity and um i've really had to and it's been a really difficult thing i've had to do i've almost had to just like not engage with it and just understand that the best way that I can serve somebody is to keep on telling my story through song, through through film, so that someone has a companion or a buoyancy aid in the in in the form of music, um, rather than be your one on one therapist or motivational speaker. Because that I just don't have the hours in the day, and it's quite emotionally draining. So I've, I've had to really learn how to like see it and go, I'm not the right person to to deal with this. And mm -hmm. even though this person might feel a little bit let down that I haven't reached out to them um yeah hopefully them coming to a place of understanding that i just that that's one message of 200 that very day of an entire life story and and why it's connected in this way and um so i've had to really work quite hardly to come place a piece of like okay i'm, I'm just not going to respond because yeah. I, I, if i respond then it opens the the door even more to an even bigger conversation and i simply can't have 200 conversations like that a day and have time to live a life you know so i that's, i that's am there with you i i get messages mm. a lot of times that are, are people saying um you know you really helped me survive covid uh, just live period but i'm maybe i'm down again and like if we can just have a conversation i think it would make it all better and and uh I actually talked with my team a ton about this because I want to help all those people. But it's the same thing. If you get 200 messages a day, you can't you can't talk no. to everybody. So yeah. um, we actually we put together um, just a few different resources for people of saying, "Hey, I'm not a I'm not a clinical therapist. You know, I'm not yeah. I'm not trained in this. I I am relating to you, and and we both you know have this life struggle in common. But um, here's some people that are actually trained to help." you through this because yeah. ultimately you and I can't help somebody as much as another person that really really knows all the different layers of the psyche and might be able to give some 100%. better direction yeah I, and I mean I've I've had things I think one of the things that was like a major turning point for me I had I had this um I had this fan who was you know he was getting my name tattooed on his hand and he was so intensely and then and then you know I I, I talked to him every now and then and and there was a point where I just wasn't giving, I suppose, you know, I wasn't giving the replies that he wanted. And he just really turned and we're like, you're so egotistical. You won't even take the time to care Aww. about me. And then started, it, it, it exploded to the point where then it was like, you're faking your illness. You're faking all this for fame. You're, uh, uh, and um, you're just taking, because at the time I'd done a fundraiser to afford Canada because this was before everything had blown up so I, didn't, I couldn't afford to to get here off what I was making on the streets busking and um it really was um it turned really venomous and he was like I'm gonna out you and tell you that you're a fraud tell everyone you're a fraud and that you're doing all this stuff if you don't um help me out and he, and he was saying I've got OCD and you, you need to I won't name any names but you need to pay me a certain amount of money 
Oh my word! And then I'm, I'm so gonna, sorry. and then I'll, and then I'll leave you alone, and I'll, and I'll stop trying to ruin your career because he was posting all these like accusations which were really unfounded that I was really using the money to, for my treatment for a studio setup and like uh, which is completely stupid. I mean, like, all of this stuff I've worked painlessly for and um, painfully for and. It it, it it was it was really sad because this was somebody with my name on his hand and 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 then for me it was like fuck if I think the the lesson was which was a harsh lesson and I know that this doesn't apply to everyone this is like one in every ten thousand or something but it was like I opened the door of empathy and was you know was there giving this person quite personal advice that which made them I guess feel connected to me on a personal level that when my time became so wrapped up in clinic so wrapped up in promotion that when I pulled away from that he felt like I didn't care about him anymore. When, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know that, A, I don't know this person, B, um, I don't know, I, I've always got empathy for people's struggles, but I just needed time for myself, you know, and, and then it turned nasty. So it was like, it was almost like the take home from that was like, oh shit, maybe I can't open the door too much because if I open the door too much, then when I don't have time to, because what, I think what uh, people who don't have these huge followings understand is, you know, they'll have the interactions with their friendship circle. But for me, I have interactions with, I could have interactions with thousands and thousands of people a day. And um, you just simply can't, you can't be there for everybody. You really can't. And so so for me, then it's about, and I have people asking me to share their fundraisers and then I share one and then I'll have 20 messages of some people going, can you share mine? And then you're like, fuck, now I've got to be selective about who I'm helping because I can't just mm -hmm. turn my platform into a, uh, a, a point that was drowned out by all these people that need help so it's really difficult and I think the, the lesson for me was like I really need to help people in the best way that I know how and that really is just music it's not me sharing somebody's thing it's not me giving somebody personal advice on how to overcome their situation it's not me giving somebody money it's it's me just doing what I've always done which is why they related to me in the first place and why they said oh you've really helped me here and um, hopefully people understand that I can't keep up all these like micro social interactions and focus on the overarching picture, which is creating music, really. Yeah, man, I'm so sorry that uh, that you had to learn that through a very, very unpleasant interaction. That sucks. Yeah, it, it is what it is. Yeah, it yeah, is what it is. It's, yeah, it's all I, learning, you know, it's all learning. Yeah, I I agree. Yeah. I, uh, man, I, I feel like I understand that just. I get you. <laughs> I get you. That's yeah. it's a really really tough spot. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, John Yance wants to know: You've busked, played gigs with the Big Push, and also done things on your own. What do you really enjoy? The camaraderie and the fun of playing in the band, or the freedom to create whatever you want, however you want? I think they're both totally different things, and I enjoy enjoy them both for certain like different reasons. Like when I'm playing with the Big Push, it's just got that. All of us, when we come together, we make a very like, it's just like pure rock and roll. It's just like, and it's got that spirit to it. And all of it, our friendship is quite chaotic within that, within that space. And, um, you know, like, especially particularly in the more earlier days, you know, we would just, we'd go and do a gig, then we'd go out partying. And then it was just like, for me, after all those years of health problems, it was so, such a cathartic place to be, just to be like, almost like be a teenager again as a 27 <laughs> year old, like, because that's kind of what I was doing. We were going, playing shows, going to house parties, just, um, I, I wasn't at this point because I couldn't drink or do any drugs, uh, still can't because of my M MCAS. It was, so it was just really just finding that buzz off life. And like, because all of us come from a place of, even though my influence is a bit more diverse, all of us share a big love for like, you know, like the Libertines, the uh, um, Arctic Monkeys, Oasis, Blur, um, all, all of that sort of like early Brit pop stuff. And we really wanted to do something like that. And also I think all of us kind of idolize that lifestyle as well of the more sort of like early nineties, mm. uh, rock and roll sort of like traditional, um, you know, we'd get kicked out of venues for like <laughs> being a little bit too fucking rowdy on stage and breaking stuff. <laughs> and I love, but we, I love the excitement of it. And then, and then my own stuff is a lot more, it's a completely different feeling. Even performing live for me with that stuff is a lot more different feeling. And it almost feels like the other one is like just, the expression of chaos and fun and music and our love for music. And then my one is more, I think I'm trying to bring more of my values of how I and philosophies of how I ran, see the world, interact with the world and how can I bring those? So it's, it's a very different creative expression. Mm -hmm. um, 
within the lyrics as well, it's a very different creative expression. And also within the performance, I think it's a lot more coming at it like a preacher almost in a way, rather than coming at it as just a, a an entertainer, I suppose. Yeah, there's a difference. Yeah, so both definitely, like it's like you need different flavors in life. You've got to have both. Yeah, and they, and they and they both serve their purpose. And and like when I'm creating something completely by myself, there's um that that creative process is a lot more different than if you're in a room, you're jamming out, and you're like, yeah, that is a sick guitar riff. Let's go with that. Let's do this bass line. Oh, this works really well together. And I love them both, man. And I, I, for, for 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 very different reasons. But I can't really compare them in terms of like which one I prefer, or mm -hmm. uh, because they just they're both. It's like comparing apples and oranges for me, even though it's both music, it, it, it's a really difficult comparison. And I really truly hope that me and the Big Push Boys play some more together in the future. It just depends where we're all at in terms of our position in life, you know, because we're all, we're all very different people, like very, very different people, um, which is one of the cool things about it. But um, I, I hope that at some point those lines intersect again. <laughs> all right, we have from Dwayne. Yeah, he said, as a person who relies on empathy to feel deeper emotions, I got a lot out of the higher end performance. As your music videos are all in one take, how many attempts did it take in recording higher end and the tale of Jenny's Screech? Or he <laughs> said, or did you guys go God mode and nail that in one? Obviously, I think you said, no, it wasn't higher end that you, we didn't get a, a number of takes on higher end. It was uh, a different video that was, uh, it was Money Game Part one that you said was like 167. Yeah. How many was High Ren? High Ren, High Ren was this really frustrating situation. So we went into this basement to film and um, we didn't have permission <laughs> as always. And then the <laughs> landlord comes down. We'd, we'd spend a while getting everything set up and perfect. The landlord comes down right before we're getting into it. And he's like, you guys are making too much noise. You've got to get out of it. And we're like, and I beg because we'd been, I, I was going to Canada in a couple of weeks. And if we didn't get it this time, it probably would never been got. I begged for him to give us time and he gave us half an hour. So from the moment of rolling, we only actually had half an hour. So oh my we gosh. did four takes. We did four takes. And what you see on that video is actually, it's a spliced together four videos, but the audio take is a one take, but the, um, from one of the, from the best one, but the video itself, because we didn't have the luxury of like getting the perfect performance because, and we were under a lot of pressure. If we don't do this in half an hour, we're fucking out Gosh. of here. So I wasn't, I wasn't the best mindset. I was actually really upset go, going into those performances, but maybe that intensity led itself to the performance <laughs> in the end. But, um, mm -hmm. but I came out of that shoot after, so we only had four takes all the way through. And I came out of that shoot being like, we haven't got it. I was just like, no fucking way we've got it. And I was really gutted. I was like devastated. I came out of that shoot. I remember um, my girlfriend at the time going back to her house and, and just and just being like, I'm so gutted. I, just, I think we fucked it. And I was like almost in, in tears because it was just, I care about these things so much. I care about doing them right. And then um, I, I came to editing it and I still felt the same way when I was editing it. And then um, I ended, we ended up just choosing moments of expression because fucking by some miracle, my internal metronome was really good that day. So it, it just worked. And um, we ended up cutting together different uh, visuals from those four takes and almost making a bit of a Frankenstein's monster. So it's not a true visual uh -huh. one take, it's just a true audio one take. I was made to be tested and twisted. I was made to be broken and beat. I was made by his hand, it's all part of his plan that I stand on my own two feet. And you know me, my will is eternal. And you know me, you've met me before. Face to face with a beast, I will rise from the east and I'll settle on the ocean floor. And I go by many names also. Some people know me as hope. Some people know me as the voice that you hear when you loosen the noose on the rope. And you know how I know that I'll prosper? Cause I stand here beside you today. I have stood in the flames that cremated my brain and I didn't once flinch or shake. So cower at the man I've become when I sing from the top of my lungs. That I won't retire, I'll stand in your fire Inspire that me to be strong And when I am gone I will rise In the music that I left behind Ferocious, persistent, immortal like you We're a climated different side and, and then we had to go handheld for that scene right at the end And that was just the only bit that's kind of like spliced on Was the bit when I stand up and deliver the monologue It was never going to be what handheld And it almost panned out in such a way that Um lent itself to it because there's, there's a moment where it switches from the 
two tripods and the front facing tripod to the handheld right at the end, it almost creates a sense of intimacy. So it's almost like this thing that luckily happened because if it hadn't, we'd have never done that sort of like handheld right at the end scene to get that last monologue bit. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it, it, only four takes that one, but we, we got, yeah, it was, Gosh. it was a very stressful shoot. <laughs> very stressful yeah. shoot. Yeah. Wow. Well, I, I do think, I think that that stress got channeled into your music in just the right way. Yeah. And what about uh, Tale of Ginny and Screech? How how long did <laughs> so <laughs> the, through the corridors with that one? And I love yeah, the different so acoustics. That I, was so I'll, cool. <laughs> I'll talk. I'll talk about Violet's Tale because um, uh -huh. the other ones I can't actually remember. But Violet's Tale, we did twenty four takes, but we actually used take number two. I think in the end, oh, it, was, it was one of these. Wow. It was it was one of these. It was one of these funny things where, like, we get a good take, a safety take, and we're like, brilliant, we got a good take. We can get now. Let's get a better one. Um, so we've got that safety when it takes the pressure off and that was take number two. And then um, we kept on going and going and going. And that was one of these things where, again, we were immersed in the elements. We had to wait till two in the morning before we could even film because there was some building works going on in the kitchen next door to this basement, which was just my friend's flat, by the way. We just, oh, it was it was actually a bike shed and we didn't ask permission. I, I believe in asking for forgiveness before asking permission. <laughs> Um, so it was a bike shed and we, we got some tools out and we moved this whole bike rack with people's bikes to the corner. Like if, but it was like one in the morning. So luckily nobody come down. If they did, we'd have probably gotten a lot of trouble. So we moved this whole bike rack. We screwed it off the floor with these bolts. We moved it off. And then the other challenge was I bought this bed from Argos, which is like this company that like would deliver furniture and stuff. And, um, it turned up and I'd abs accidentally, this is the, the, the joys of not having a producer and leaving things to an ADHD guy. Um, I'd ordered a child sized bed. So like we had this really to the floor bed that we were meant to make at the hospital. So my friend Josh had to go home and build this like frame for it that lifted Whoa. it up. So you can actually, I think you can actually see it in a section that this bed is like hovering off the floor. We dress it to make it look like a hospital bed and we, we make that whole thing look like a hospital room. <laughs> Was a silent girl grew up with violent starts. Her mother was a drinker and her father was a bastard. Every night he took a tie but never left the room. I'll spare you of the things he did, I'm sure her mother knew. Violet was a silent girl, she moved out at 16 A semi-detached council flat, paid for by a welfare scheme Packing shelves at Tesco, stacking jars like pickled bricks She met a boy named Stevie and he was a little prick Violet was a silent girl and Violet she fell fast See Stevie was a wrong and but he sure knew how to charm her Every night he'd talk a tie but never left the room History repeats itself, he'd paint her black and blue and dark uh, She never stood a chance The devil comes to die and um, but Benny's flat was the, there was had this like kind of Kubrick esque feel to it that I really like with that like really stark white corridor leading into the mm -hmm. bike shed, which is the hospital room, and then the door outside leading into an alleyway that lo almost looks like the tail of Jenny's tail. So it kind of comes full circle. So it was like the perfect location. And then yeah, so we did twenty seven takes. It started raining at one point. There was actually one beautiful take, and it's such a shame we never got to use this one. Um, it was one of these beautiful moments, but the whole performance wasn't as good. It was later on and like basically right at the end, when you get to the right, the really tense bit, it starts raining in this perfect moment and you see the rain Whoa. coming down with the green lights and it was beautiful end moment. But because it's a one take, you really have to take into account the whole thing, not just the end. So even though we had this like perfectly in synchronized moment with like nature, um, we ended up going with an earlier take where it wasn't raining just because the performance was a lot better. Um, but yeah, 27, 24 takes all together, but we actually use take number two for that. Man, I, if I, uh, if I were running a, a Patreon for you, I would offer moments like that, those kinds of outtakes as like one of the mm. benefits. They're all there somewhere. Beautiful. Yeah, they're all there somewhere on a hard drive. Yeah. That's so cool. That's, that's beautiful yeah. to hear you talk about that. Yeah. That's really awesome. All right. Last question. I love this question because... Oh man, it just, it strikes so well, I think for singers in particular. Um, Quirky Uncle Dave asks, 
When someone has written a song about their personal experience that is very emotionally significant to them, it feels wrong for me to sing a cover of it if I haven't shared a similar experience or don't have some connection to those emotions. I'm wondering how you, as a creator of such songs, would feel about others doing covers of your work just because they enjoyed your music. Oh, 100% fine about it. Yeah, I mean, I've, I start, when I go out on the streets, I'm always busking other people's songs and and a lot of the times I'm not directly relating to those lyrics in any shape or form. I just love how it feels, you know? I mean, a lot of like Bob Marley songs hmm. um, uh, are about racial inequality and, and, and it's something um, that, I, that I haven't lived through that adversity, but there's still something that I find within the power of those lyrics, even though they're not directly relatable to my journey when I sing them it feels really good and it feels really good to almost take up a fight that isn't my own for that moment in time <laughs> um so yeah I, I feel I feel like it's great you know I, I I'd hope that anybody who wants to sing my songs doesn't feel like they belong to me because they don't belong to me I feel like as soon as I've written them and released them into the world they're not mine anymore they're everybody else's um so yeah I, 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 I and I love I love Th feeling like other people are getting creative joy out of putting their own spins on things that I'm doing. It's really cool. It's super, super generous. <laughs> mm. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Um, and uh, we're going to wrap this up. Thank you so much for, oh my gosh, taking over two hours with me. The final, final thing that all of us need to know is how do we get your album? <laughs> um, it's still available. <laughs> we've got, we've got really, we've got really cool physical copies of it. Um, the the Brigitte are amazingly designed and put together. They look really really cool. So you can it's sickboyalbum dot com, and then iTunes, um, Amazon, all of the the usual suspects, Bandcamp. It's available everywhere, um, and I post links to that all around the place. So yeah, it's 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 quite easy to get, and we're we've got a good team of people posting them out, so they <laughs> they're coming quite quickly as well. We will make sure that all of those links are in the information section below this interview as well. So. Uh, awesome. go everyone go get sick boy and listen to it all <laughs> the way through and then support Ren in any way you can I know uh, for me it was when I first heard about you I was wanting to support you and your GoFundMe and making sure yeah. that you still have uh, incredible health and you're still able to get the kinds of treatments that you need to make sure that you can appreciate continue that. releasing music that moves people that makes life better I appreciate that yeah yeah, yeah. thank you yes thank you so much and uh, I'm going to cheers to you, you with a with the, I think it's pretty much gone. I like left like one little tiny sip left in there. Is nice. there is there like a tiny bit of backwash left in your water? <laughs> We've got a few drops. Cheers. Okay, to the last Cheers. drops. <laughs> Thanks. Mm.